Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. This is Mormon Stories, Mormon Expression Edition. It is October 20th, 2022. And as always, we are so excited to have as one of our trusted friends and colleagues, the John Larson uh, of Mormon Expression Podcast fame. Hey, John Larson. Hello, everybody. Are you joining us from your underground bunker is somewhere in Oregon? Is that right? I, I am from an undisclosed location, indeed. <laughs> uh, Kara has visited my undisclosed location. Kara who? Yeah. Kara who? Hey, Kara. The Kara. Oh, hey, the Kara. one and only. <laughs> I flew on an airplane to go visit that, like, jolly old fella. And, and I apologize. Hey, I apologize we're late today. It's my fault. I was messing around with equipment. No worries. No worries, John. And if John and Kara weren't enough, we have joining us in studio, Samantha Shelley as well from God. Zelf on the Shelf. Hello. Samantha, it's so always great to have you as a co-host. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Pleasure check, to be here. Check out Zelf on the Shelf. Check out Samantha Shelley, what, Life Coaching Extravaganza? Do check it out. Yep. That's the, oh. <laughs> hey, uh, Samantha, okay. I'll tell you something. Um, I, 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 I've confessed this many times, but. I never watch or listen to Mormon podcasting. I never have. I never will. And you shouldn't have to. Except I've watched you guys sometimes because you make me laugh. Oh my God. Yay. Thank you, John Lawson. Wow. Yeah. That's a big compliment. Uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. On my it recommendation? I'm just trying to weave myself into this narrative. <laughs> yeah, was it? <laughs> you can have it if you want it, I guess. I don't <laughs> anyway, that's awesome. So yeah, check out Zelf on the Shelf. And also check out Nuance O'Kara. You released an episode you're really excited about uh, today, right? Yeah, not that I need to tell you, folk. It's just probably all around the algorithm already. It's just, <laughs> it's been, it was a really exciting day. Uh, I had a video with my friend Eve, who sat in this chair, and me and John did a video on my Nuance Ho YouTube channel um, telling a Mormon just uh, some facts that she didn't know about Joseph mm -hmm. Smith and letting her react to them in real time and answer or and ask questions and have us answer them. And it's really informative. And people keep saying it's like the greatest video that they can't wait to like share with kind of, you know, people who are on the fence believers. So I'm just really proud to put out that content today. And I'm proud of Eve for doing it with me. And I'm just uh, really grateful for everybody who watched. So that came out today. So make sure you check it out. Yeah. And please support Nuance Ho and her Patreon channel or her donor box, donor button, become a monthly donor. We got to pay for these content creators or they'll go away. Right, Samantha? Yeah, we will. Yeah. We're always on the edge of going away. <laughs> it could happen at any moment. Yeah, that'd be bad. Okay, so uh, today, the the uh, I think this podcast is entitled Your Friend, the Church. We are going to be talking about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon Church and their history filing amicus briefs with, I don't know, the Supreme Court or other courts. And I I haven't done a lot of background research for today, so I'm going to be relying on the heavy lifting of John Larson and Kara Burrell. And of course, you know a lot about the Supreme Court, right, Samantha? Well, I was going to say, who will be explaining what an amicus brief is? I can do that at some point. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Let's start there. <laughs> John John may help with that as well. Anyway, um, I will say that this, this whole... Uh, Series is part of the Mormon Expression series on Mormon Stories podcast. John Larson uh, used to host an amazing epic podcast called Mormon Expression. You can find that on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Mormon Expression podcast. It's, I don't know, 300-ish of some of the best Mormon-themed podcasting ever made. But John, after, we were able to um, motivate John Larson to come out of a retirement and to do a monthly episode on Mormon Stories because of gracious donors. So if you like the John Larson content on Mormon Expression, we've had some significant donors to the Mormon Expression Project bail. It's not in any risk of going away anytime soon. But if you love John Larson and Kara Burrell and the Mormon Expression content on Mormon Stories, please go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression, become a monthly donor to the John Larson Project, and we'll have John Larson on along with Kara, as long as John will do it. Anything you want to add to that, John Larson? No, thanks for uh, hosting the old Mormon Expression stuff, and uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, John, is, as a matter of um, absolving him, never uh, puts any restraint on what I am allowed to say. Um, so he just tells me to, to do whatever I want. So I appreciate, I appreciate that freedom. Samantha, do you feel the same way? Exactly the same. <laughs> I just had, I just had a conversation with Samantha off camera. Every time, 
every time somebody talks about capitalism, uh, we lose donors and, you know, anti-capitalism kind of stuff. And this is a pro Jeff Bezos podcast. <laughs> we want to make that very clear right off the bat. Do not unsubscribe. Everything in this room was literally ordered from Amazon too. So like, that's actually true. Yeah, we're all prime customers and that will never change. Yeah. However many rainforests go away. No, but, um, no, it's, it's, I think maybe we can talk for this about this for two minutes, but you know, obviously we want, we want to reach people who are trying to process Mormonism. And I'm always torn because I, I have very strong political views. I had strong political views before I had strong, uh, progressive or post Mormon views. So I care a lot about politics and government. And honestly, I feel like Mormon stories moves the needle in terms of helping people become more sensitive to the causes I care about more than almost anything. And at the same time, I don't want to alienate people. I don't want to people think that this is a partisan program that if, if whatever your political party or ideology is that you're not welcome here. So we're always, we're always trying to figure out the right balance and I always want my guests to be authentic. And so we'll just figure it out, but just know that my guests have the political views they have as do I, we want everyone to feel welcome. <clears throat> And at some point, we need to have some some political conservatives on who are thoughtful yeah, you know, to be able to have some type of dialogue. I've been trying to get that Greg guy, Greg Matson from C uh, Quick Channel, that YouTuber, you know. But darn it, he's speaking at Rod Meldrum's convention this weekend, <laughs> um, the Book of Mormon Evidence one. He's all tied up with them. So darn it, I just can't get an intelligent conservative to come in here. I'm trying. Um, I would also like to say that more important than my political views, and I feel like this is probably the same for both of you too, is just believing that we're all more than our views. And all of our views are the result of just whatever we've been exposed to in our lives and whatever our brains have sort of been wired to value more than other things. So, you know, we, do, we don't buy into sort of polarizing narratives about like good and bad. I don't see it that way at all. I think whoever you are like everyone's worthy of love and respect i don't think anyone's an idiot you know yeah we're yeah, on I, the same team yeah i'm reading a book called why we're polarized and it's a really mm. interesting book but i i hate re i actually hate religious polarization because i think it's counterproductive and i mm -hmm. i don't like political the level of political polarization that we have now now having said all that john larson i'm guessing you have some thoughts or feelings as well on all this no, I'll just, I'll just let it slide. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will say this. We live in a, a polarized time indeed. Politics is about power and political power. Um, power. And uh, one of the, the cheap tricks that's being deployed right now is the, the um, umbrella of what people call political is expanding further and further and further and further and further. Till now it includes things like basic reproductive care, um, the existence of LGBT people, the existence of slavery. And, and so, so... The, the, the problem is that um, there is truth and there is not truth. And there's some things that are, are we don't know. But um, um, yeah, I've, I have long walked away from lots of money because I'm not for sale. Um, I have uh, upset many rich donors who have tried to influence me and people around me to get me to say or not say things. And um, I'll say what I believe. And, and I would say that if you're so um, sensitive in your views that you can't encounter somebody who has um, um, different views than you, then um, yeah, go, go away. Um, but um, people like me, um, I read the right wing um, um, voraciously. Um, and um, I think it's important to know what's happening. We're living in an age of um, confusion. And, yeah. um, and so I can't, I simply, I, I, I respect what people are saying, but, I can't come into this podcast and be able to speak the truth about Mormonism while meanwhile trying to navigate around whatever pegs you all have put down and saying, you can talk truth here, but you can't talk truth here. You totally. can say this, but you can't say that. I cannot operate. I will go and continue to speak my truth and ask for correction. Um, and I can't do anything else. Mormonism, politics, um, nationalism, um, it's all the same animal. And I'm not going to tolerate one because some people are more sensitive. So that's the way it is. And um, when it's time to kick me off, I will say um, thanks for all the fish. That's not happening. No, that's why we love you, John Larson. And uh, yeah, we don't we we stick by our uh, no muzzle no muzzle uh, policy. And that goes for you too, Samantha. 
Yeah, and if this isn't isn't an example <laughs> of what you resist persists, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, no, this is good. I, it's more of a disclaimer than anything. But John, <coughs> we love you and be you. How's that? Yeah, thanks. And and I I I enjoy um, interacting with the other side or people who have different views than than me. But what you're probably going to be peppered with, and you can look at the comments since these like these, is questions from me as mm -hmm. I try to understand. And, you know, probably one of my biggest frustrations, and I think it kind of it will lead into something we're going to talk about today, is just this lack of understanding of basic terminology. I, I, I doubt one in 10,000 Americans could define what socialism is. I doubt one in 100,000 Americans could define what capitalism is. Um, and so it's just hard to have these discussions when people have terms that they don't understand and then they play a plant a big fence around them, you know, so. We do yeah, our best. Love it. Okay. Well, um, so that's kind of one way to start the show. John, did you have <laughs> any other announcements before we dive into today's topic? I do. Um, you know, we always want to follow up. Um, if, 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 if I've said anything wrong or if there's information from um, previous shows, I like to... Um, I like to uh, circle back on those things. And again, this is an open invite for people to sh show me where I'm wrong. I, I belong to no political parties. I never have. I belong to no religions. I, I haven't since I left the church, really. I don't affiliate with any. I'm just looking for 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 truth and knowledge. That's that's all I care about. So if, if you can show me where there's something that I believe that's off, I, I will reward you the best I can uh, because that's what I want. I want to be showed that i'm wrong and and you know I've, I've thought about it before one of the reasons i think i became kind of bombastic when i was leaving the church is i was trying to get anybody to save my soul i was trying to and i had to push harder and harder and harder and then i eventually pushed the whole thing off the edge of the cliff so <laughs> i loved your theme on mormon expression is there a better way to get this point across it's like how do i get this point across could anybody help me <laughs> right right Okay, so that was my uh, long-winded introduction. Um, unfortunately, we have to follow up on the lake. Um, there have been um, a few developments um, with the, the Great Salt Lake. As a reminder, a few months ago, we recorded a rather heart-wrenching story. Um, you know, uh, Utah's my home. I mean, I, I, I grew up there. My family's there. Um, it's a place that I love. Um, and if you remember in um, the podcast before, I gave a warning that, that, of course, the New York Times gave the same warning that at 17% salinity, um, the brine fish start to die. Um, the a lake is sitting at 18% salinity right now. Um, and um, it spiked. Uh, but I read two reports, one that said had a, it spiked at 22% over the summer. Another said 25%. According to Bonnie Baxter, who is, um, I think, at Westminster College, she's studying the place. She says this, we're not seeing any fly pupa today. That's terrifying. So if you recall, the, 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 everyone's focusing on the water in the lake. But what I tried to um, redirect saying there are 10 billion birds that, that um, fly from Canada to Mexico or places in between that um, winter over or summer over or, or they, they go to the wetlands of the lake where they feed mostly on brine flies that feed on brine shrimp. And brine shrimp are a very unique organ, um, organism and they cannot survive really in salinity above 17%. There's also another thing, I didn't have this in my notes, but I was reading about it last week. There is kind of a uh, relative of coral, like coral reef that lives in the lake. And um, they, they said that last year, you know, it gets exposed and it turns from green to white. And then when the water came back in the winter, it bounced back. This last year, it didn't. Um, so um, the lake is in is in dire straits, and um, I don't know what to do, but just keep sounding the alarm. I'm 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 sorry. This is one of those things um, that uh, there, there's a few bellwethers that have been that that the world is starting to focus on in terms of climate change. And the Great Salt Lake is one of them. So there's inter national and international news. There's stories on the Great Salt Lake every two or three days. And, and Samantha, you were saying the Zelf on the Shelf, in, in addition to the episode we did on Mormon Stories about the Great Salt Lake, <clears throat> Samantha, you were saying Zelf on the Shelf has, has something as well. Yeah, so we interviewed um, a, a research guy called Mike the Vegan. And he we talked about how, I think, 
I check double check these statistics, but like 85% of water usage from the Great Salt Lake is for animal agriculture that makes up only around 3% of the economy. So I just thought that was interesting because, I mean, we see that with a lot of environmental disasters that animal agriculture is contributing massively. Yeah, yeah and, and it, it's it's even worse than what you said because um, it's not just, um, you know, there 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 is a lot of um, cattle, especially up, up in the north, but most of the agriculture in Utah is alfalfa that is grown to feed animals, but the alfalfa goes overseas. So it's 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 not even something that's contributing to the you know the food environment of Utah or the country. It's just mm -hmm. an economic. So 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 these these if you look at it this way, these countries from um, uh, you know across the water are are using up the last of the resource that the Mormon people depend on in order to make money. That is a minor portion of Utah's economy. The the amount of deference that agriculture is given does not equal the amount of economic impact on the on the utah economy unfortunately got it uh there's another there's another story um from axios um and and the guardian um who have been um tracing this axios um went into salt lake city uh the church in june um released a statement i don't i don't have the statement um oh i do have the statement a watering law of lawns and landscapes at temples, meeting houses, and other buildings is being reduced. In some cases, landscape will be permitted to brown and become dormant. Um, so Axios went to Salt Lake City and um, went to 120 meeting houses. And they, uh, this was recent. This was in September. And they found only four. Only four of those lawns showed any sign of distress. Now, you know, the margin of error on that is those four might have just had sprinkler problems. Who, who, who knows? But... Um, the church has made no action, um, and their lawns are as green as green. In fact, um, where I live in in, um, in Oregon, I drive by an LDS church every day, and the habit out here is that the grass goes brown. Even though we live in a rainforest, the grass grows, goes brown during the summer. And uh, my, on my whole drive, I, I drive about four miles. Everything is brown except for one place which is the LDS chapel, which is just green as green as green. So, um, yeah, the, the, the church is not doing anything. And, and the Guardian, um, I, I recommend anybody look up this article. Um, it makes a re re really great case. The, the, the article is titled Lawns Are Godly. And the fact that Mormons believe that the, the desert shall blossom as a rose, for many Mormons, those green, green lawns, and of course, Utah uses more water per capita than any other state in the United States, is part of the fulfillment of Mormon theology. And as long as the church's lawns are green, the Mormons will follow. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So do what you can. And uh, one way to really impact things is to depend less on meat as a source of your diet, right? Yeah, I, I think mean, that's the biggest way you can reduce your personal water consumption. Yeah. Because it's just yeah. inefficient to have to grow plants to feed to animals and then eat the animals. I and mean, you, water the animals, right? Yeah, the yeah. amount of land, you know. Yeah, land. You know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, John. Thanks for giving us that update. And, and we definitely care about the environment and the earth. So in Utah. So thank you for that update. Yeah, yeah, uh, I would say my pleasure, but not really. Um, I'm, I'm. There are, there are, there are. They're starting to talk about actions. Um, I, I should acknowledge the the North um, Railroad berm. There's a, a railroad line that cuts right across the lake. As a matter of fact, if you look at Google Maps, you can see it because it reduced the salinity or um, of the north section, or it changed the salinity, and um, the two sections of the lake are different colors. So they're actually raising right now. They're in the middle of raising the railroad up to get more water moving back and forth between the two sections um, to try to, to stem this, um, this, this, this tragedy. Yeah. So they are responding to Mormon stories podcast and John Larson. Uh, it's just taking them a while. And <laughs> I have, I have read that they're thinking about diverting a lot of the agricultural water back into the lake. So there's talk of it. It will happen. It's just how long do we put it off? Yeah. It's inevitable, you know? All right. Okay. Announcements before we jump in or, uh, no, that, that, that was all I had to cover there. All right. Well, let's jump into the main event for today. We're talking about the Mormon church and amicus briefs and Kara's saying, what the heck is an amicus brief? Right? I'm not saying that. 
Well, I'm I American. Mean, <laughs> I have that word tattooed in my arm. So no offense, Sam, Samantha. No offense. So so yeah, let's uh, right before we jump in, I'm gonna I want to ask a question first of all to to everybody listening that I'm gonna ask at the end of this um this podcast. Same question. I'm gonna ask it right now, so you can keep it in the back of your mind and think about it. Of of everything we're gonna talk about for the next two hours or so, what does any of this have to do with Jesus? I mean, uh, Mormons have always said that they're a, a Christian denomination, that they, they believe in the same Jesus everybody else does. And, and it's the Jesus of the Gospels, the, the, four, you know, the four books in the Bible. And so we have what Jesus wrote and spoke of. It's well understood, been studied for 2,000 years. What does any of this have to do with Jesus? That's the question I wanted to plant in the back of your head. Okay. I All right. I think you're poisoning the well, John Larson. You're poisoning the well. I'm kidding. I'm, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about, because I used it, an, an amicus curiae brief is, it's Latin, and it just simply means friend of the courts. So when major rulings come up, the um, justices or the judges, um, this, this happens at, at different levels. No matter everything we're going to be covering today are all Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court cases, except for one. I have one um, Nevada State Supreme Court case that I kind of bent the rules for a little bit. And actually, I have another one in there where the, the church is not the, um, uh, the amicus. They are the petitioner. So I did bend my rule for two of these. Um, but but what 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 these things allow is that generally speaking, I think if I wrote a um, uh, friend of the court's brief and submitted to the Supreme Court, it wouldn't go anywhere. So this is a way to allow for powerful, influential um, political organizations to weigh in on these cases. And if you read cases, um, they will oftentimes uh, if, if, if you read the decisions you can see that the Supreme Court justices do indeed sometimes borrow language wholesale from these amicus briefings. So, so they are an important part of our political system, or our, our, our I shouldn't say political system, our governance system, um, for, for good or for bad. And they've, they've been around for, for, for a long, long time. Um, but they, they do allow us to um, understand some things. And we're going to get to that point in a second. Um, so first, as I always like to do, let's delve into Mormon history a little bit to get us grounded and talk about why we are where we're at. Okay. Okay. So if we recall, um, during the Nauvoo period, um, Joseph Smith set up two parallel forms of government. And I'm sure there's been Mormon stories episodes where you've covered the Council of 50 and, and, and whatnot. All right, John? Uh, maybe not as much as I'd like. I, I do believe there's an old Mormon expression one on the on the Council okay. of Fifty. We'll have Maven put that in the show notes for sure. So so um, so basically, um, Joseph Smith had set up the the priesthood um, in in a, in a form of what we know it, or what you can read in the Doctrine and Covenants, that there was the president of the church, the first presidency, and then the the quorum of the twelve and the quorum of the seventy. Although at the time that that Joseph Smith was alive, he said that those three were equal in power. Um, and then later, of course, um, Brigham Young kind of put it into the patriarchal hierarchy that we kind of know and love today. So, so that was the governance of the church. But Joseph Smith also set up a, another um, governance body called the Council of Fifty. And the Council of Fifty was in place to actually rule the world. So, so um, they would define it that the, the church governance ruled the church. But um, Joseph Smith had himself anointed king of, of the entire world, uh, a process that was repeated by both Brigham Young and John Taylor. Those three had secret ceremonies where they were anointed king of the world. Um, and Leonardo, and Leonardo as, as Karen and I mentioned in our last episode, also Leonardo DiCaprio. John loves a callback. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio was king of the world? Too? Oh, yeah. Titanic? It just took me a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, not the connection with him having women that are under a certain age. That's a different connection to be, him being the king of the world. So there's some interesting things about the Council of 50. We'll briefly go over three of the members of the Council of 50, the original one set by Joseph Smith, were not members of the church. So it's clear that Joseph Smith was looking to expand his power and his influence beyond the church. But the Council of 50 didn't 
get a lot of action. We have some of their notes. I don't think we have all of them yet. Um, and and they didn't get tons of action before he was um, assassinated. So um, so, but then when they went over to Utah, Brigham Young reinstituted the Council of Fifty, and they were in in place for a long time. I think the best uh, book on this, if you're interested, is uh, D. Michael Quinn's um, Origins of of Mormon Church Origins of Power. Um, and he talks about um, as as they raised this up. Um, so in Joseph Smith theology, um, the the Mormons, the restoration was here to restore the old order, the old priesthood order, and to set up a shadow government that Jesus Christ would take the helm of on his return. So um, the the early saints were literally building the kingdom of God in their mind, um, and that and that the government that would be moved to Missouri um, would become the one world government. And, and these beliefs still survive today. And, you, you know, you hear those like the white horse prophecy, the constitutional hang by a thread and it'll be saved by elders of the church and, and, and all, all that sort of stuff. It, it all has to do with the belief that the, that a Mormonism is not just a religion, but it, it's free to operate in the secular world. And they did, they own businesses and they, they still do. And and um, there's great books. Uh, 1986, The Mormon Corporate Empire is the book that finally got the church to start divesting. Before 86, if you would have gone to like Union Pacific Railroad board meetings, they would have been, you know, most of the board of directors would have been actual sitting apostles and things like that. So it's, it's in recent history. In a lot of our lifetime, the church was heavily, heavily involved in, in business. Um, but I, I want to point out that's part of, of the doctrine that that in, in, in Mormonism, historical Mormonism, there's no differentiation between church and state. Um, and, you know, Brigham Young, of course, was governor of the state and president of the church, and that caused all sorts of problems when, when he died. Um, for a long time, up until Reed Smoot, um, the, the um, senators were always apostles, you know, and and I mean, that continued. Ezra Tapp Benson was secretary of agriculture while being a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. So so up until not that many decades ago, um, there was no distinction between um, political um, political um, government and church, which, again, to go to where we started this thing. I don't know how the hell I'm supposed to talk about the church without talking about politics when the Mormon church is, is an extremely active political entity, and I would say more so a political entity than a religion, but I divert. Yeah. All right. Are, are you guys with me so far? 100%. Chairs in, Samantha. Okay, so no. the church has long had a law firm, um, and for a long time it was Curtin, McConkie, and Pullman, and then um, there was some controversy with Pullman, and he was removed. Curtin and McConkey um, sits in on the north side of um, City Creek, just south of the temple. And there is literally a tunnel between that law firm and the um, church office building and the temple. So um, it's one of the or only organizations that I know of that connects um, literally its most holy place with its legal um, entity, with its law firm. Um, Curtin and McConkie take clients outside the church, but they are the principal um, and only a law firm that the church deploys. So, um, and they are, um, it's, yes, it's that McConkie's. They are the old um, blue blood Mormon families. So, so it's, it's, um, and there's all sorts of stories about that, that, that law firm. Um, I don't have any um, interest in disparaging them other to say than they're the, the legal arm of the church. And so they file most of these briefings. Um, many of the briefings are filed under um, Kurt McConkie representing the church. There are a few that are filed, especially older ones that are filed just under Kurt and McConkie. But, um, but those two organizations, there's, there's no, there's no daylight between them. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, um, um, Nonprofits versus profits, um, and um, let's. We have to talk a tiny bit about um, capitalism. I'm sorry, but just just kind of define it. So, so in a capitalistic economic system, the 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 laws and the structure are are set up around the capital, and that's what 
we have now or, or the money that's invested in, in the company. So in our legally, how corporations are run in the United States is the capital is the principal thing. And then there's managers who manage the capital. And in, in, in fact, if um, you can get into legal jeopardy as a, an executive of a company, if you make decisions that don't serve the, the, the capital. So there's, there's actual legal and fiduciary responsibility to um, return investment on the capital. And then we have labor and, and resources. Um, and uh, the, those three things exist, but our system is set up around protecting the, the, the capital. And, you know, for example, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know this. Most companies have two types of stock. There's privileged stock and then there's the regular stock. When you buy stock in the stock market, you're not getting the privileged stock. So this is just an example of how the law is set up that um, if a company is going bankrupt, all the privileged people get paid out before the um, the, the con you can't even buy privileged stock. You don't, unless you're an insider and you know how to get there. It's just not available in the market. I'm sorry. Did somebody have something? No, you, your your mic went out for a second, but it's back. Okay. Um. So so the reason I bring that up is then we have nonprofit corporations. So for profit corporations or a default corporation is designed legally, and our again our whole jurisprudence system is designed around this to to make return on the capital. A nonprofit um, follows all the same kind of corporate guidelines. It just doesn't have any any shareholders. It doesn't have any capital up there that it's it's doing a return on investment. And people get this confused because they think a nonprofit is a company that doesn't have a profit. Um, it's not true. It means that there's no profit on the capital because we're a capitalist um, society or a capitalist legal form. So so like the church can and and there's legal precedence the church can actually as a nonprofit can own for profit entities they just have to pay taxes and submit to the legal wranglings of of those for profit entities and in those cases the church being a nonprofit organization is the capitalist in the for profit organization i know it gets it gets squishy and weird but this is what the church does all the time this is the world they live in um, and and it really defines who they are and what they do and it's important for what we're going to be talking about so when we talk about a nonprofit, never get confused. If you say like Intermountain Health is a nonprofit, they'll still make billions of dollars a year. They just distribute it to the officers or to in other ways rather than um, a return on a investment because there are no um, investitures. So so um, the 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 important part that it's coming up here is the church is a corporation. First and foremost, it acts like a corporation. It breathes like a corporation. It is a corporation. The officers of the church, the, the holy men of the priesthood, are selected for their corporate bona fides. They are corporate attorneys. They are corporate financiers. They are corporate executives. If you look down the resumes of who the 70 and the 12 and the people are, they are CEOs of Mars Bar. They are people who, who rose in the ranks. They worked in the military industrial complex. They worked all over. These are people who are well-versed in corporate America. And that's not a judgment call. I'm just saying corporate America is part of our system. And, and we select the officers of the church from corporate America. So it should be no surprise that the church acts like a corporation all the time um, and has an, a set of attorneys who act like, um, like um, corporate attorneys. Um, we live in a post-truth world right now, um, which is kind of unfortunate. The, the, the internet and other advancements have made it so that basically anybody like me can say anything they want at any time on, on the internet. And there's some good in that, but it, it allows for a lot of confusion. Um, and so, and there's a lot of legal loopholes around truth. You know, we can talk about the concept of puffery, which is a real legal term. Puffery allows um, people to inflate um, claims around products and things like that without getting into trouble. And there's a lot of wiggle lines and people are always pushing them and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so why do I bring this up? In the post-truth world where, where so much money and so much legal um, wrangling has been done to protect corporations, protect corporate officers, 
The only thing you can really believe for a corporation is what their lawyers say. So I go through that whole exposition to say this. If you want to know what the Mormon church really believes, what they really value, what they really are all about, you're going to get more of that truth by reading these amicus briefings, because that's in the language of their lawyers. That's really what matters in our legal system. What missionaries say, what they say over the pulpit, what they say in their scriptures, what they say in their history books, doesn't matter. What their lawyers say matters. So this is an important topic because this is one of the only ways to cut through all the baloney and get at what the church really values and really holds to. Hey, John, do you mind if we do we mind if we explore that for just one second? Please go ahead. Also, thanks to JC talking about capitalism and nonprofits. Thanks to JC for the super chat. He just gave Woo. 20 bucks. Uh, I'll go ahead and read his comment as well. Um, JC writes, this social Democrat happy to chip in over and over and above my monthly donation to make up some for one of those who just left over here in capitalism discussed. Thank you, John Larson team. Join me. Fellow open-minded listeners. I love it. Yes. Thank you, JC. Thanks, JC. And JC is actually a woman. Okay. Oh, JC. All right. And and Kara Maven saying my 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 sound's not coming in quite as loud as other people. So okay. Um, okay. So John, let me push back on that a little bit because I'm sure yeah. <clears throat> if if you were to ask even Dal H. Oaks, but the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve, um you know, is it true that if you, if you want to know what the Mormon church really thinks and feels and cares about us, the lawyers, number one, I'm sure they would all say that's wrong because that sounds horrible. Even Oaks would say that's wrong. Um, even though he's the chief lawyer, but, but I probably would guess that in their own hearts, they don't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't register it that way. They would say, no, no, no. What's most important is Jesus and, and our gospel and our doctrine and the people and, you know, the law, legal stuff is just what we need to do to exist in a temporal world. So what what would you say if if the leaders were to take umbrage with that reductionist characterization that all they really care about is legal stuff? Well, of course they'd say that. I would say you have to ask their lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> what do their lawyers say? Because I, 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 you don't you, you can you can be of any political persuasion and look at the last 30 years at least of of goings on in Washington and lies don't matter like people can lie and there's no consequences right everybody everybody in power right now is lying all the time so why wouldn't they lie well they won't lie when it it will cost them dearly when they get caught and you, it costs dearly when you have your lawyers lie for you so let let their lawyers craft a well crafted legalistic statement explaining why we should believe what they say I mean, because, because my, my point, point is where things really matter for the church, what things really matter, property, money, um, and the things we're going to talk about over the next hour, they don't, the, 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 12, the, 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 the prophets don't talk. Curtin and McConkey does. Um, so, so I would say that let's look, John, let's look and see what Curtin and McConkey says versus what the church says. Yeah. Let's see how consistent Curtin and McConkie is versus how consistent the prophets are. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm just trying to, and Kara, I want to get you in and also you, Sam, I, I'm, I, the, part of me wants to play a little bit of a advocate for the church or believers role, since we don't have a believer in our little panel here. Um, I, I will say that if I just do my own thinking and analysis, there, there are at least two things that come to mind that have always really blown me away about the modern Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. One is Dallin H's Dallin H. Oaks's statement that we neither seek nor give apologies. Like it's hard to contemplate a more unchristlike comment than that when we know that Jesus is all about repentance and forgiveness and all that. But that that comes from the law. That is basically any lawyer will tell you ap apologies equal guilt, and they lead to. Um, culpability and legal settlements. So never admit guilt. So that statement that Oaks makes is informed by law. The only other thing that just blows my mind is the way the church has always handled abuse, how it always seems to protect the abusers at the expense of the abused, how it silences and quiets victims of abuse. 
and just doesn't doesn't protect victims and that has to be legally driven it has to be all about protecting the assets protecting the good name of the church and and it's got to be lawyers behind that part of the church's inexplicable history of of defending perpetrators Kara, let's get you in um, I just want to add to what's been said already that, you know, when I was Mormon, I looked at these these men as my spiritual leaders. These are the people who hold the keys that unlock my salvation. I need to watch General Conference. I need to obey the prophets. And I just have this echo of the Colby and Cami Reddish interview all the time of what happened in, in their case with, you know, a bishop that was a predator. And when they kept asking, OK, well, how come this wasn't you know made more aware? Anytime you ask questions and you go to a spiritual leader in the Mormon church, they're going to defer to their lawyers. And I remember Colby and Cami saying in that interview that like the, their their bishop, their stake president, they all ended up with their hands in the air saying the church lawyers decided this for us. And so when you assume that you become part of this church because there's a spiritual mantle on these people's shoulders, it's always just somebody kicking the can down to a lawyer. And especially when you bring Oaks into the situation that he graduates from law school in 1957 and then he goes and becomes a, a teacher at the uh, University of Chicago and then becomes the president of the of BYU and then is in the Utah Supreme Court um, up until 84 when he joins straight from being a judge, straight into uh, being uh, an apostle, a special witness for Jesus Christ. And the very first thing that he does is he writes a, a legal defense for the church when they need it, a legal defense called uh, Principles to Govern Possible Public Statement on Legislating Affecting Rights of Homosexuals. So he goes straight from the legal legality center of his brain into the exact same part, but he's using it for religious reasons and trying to give the church um, you know, a better foothold on how to take away gay rights from people all the way up until this this very day. And so I just, I really feel like when I was Mormon, I wanted these people to be my spiritual leaders, but they always are just going to fall back on uh, what is most advantageous for the church's growth um, and not actually what is best for its its church membership. And they have blood on their hands when they do that. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kara. Um, Samantha. Well, my thoughts on this are it's very human for us to want to psychoanalyze people in power and be like, what are their intentions? You know, do the apostles see all the business legal stuff as the main thing? Do they put Jesus Christ at the center? And I, I feel like it, it's somewhat irrelevant. We're like when we're talking about people in power, who cares what their intentions are? Who cares like how they think and feel? The reality is just like what they're doing with their power and what the impact of that is, you know? Yeah. I yeah, know that's the. That's the most powerful thing. I'm also going to say, if we were to look at the most common profession of members of the First Presidency Quorum of the Twelve and theologian, first, first <laughs> school teacher, like <laughs> elementary school teacher, farmer, right? Feminist leader, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, historian. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I the think historians it's, are actually lawyers too. I know, it's a funny right. mix of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, even the church historians are, are lawyers. But but I think the most common profession amongst Mormon general authorities is attorneys. I think, I mean, maybe it's businessmen, but, but usually, I, usually they're both, right. You know, you'll, you'll see a lot of them that have their MBA and their, and their JD or their, you know, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah that's, that's, that's important. All right, John, keep going, brother. No, I, I don't want to say I absolutely uh, uh, want to underline Samantha's comment that so, so often they're, they're given apologetics by climbing into their head and I say, we can't climb into their head, but we can look at what they write, especially if they write it to the Supreme Court, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Anybody who's ever worked with Deseret Book or any other institution of the church knows that the church is micromanaging every piece of, of literature that goes on their shelf. Every, and the idea that there is any daylight between the church and its legal firm, I find completely laughable. And, and you know, to, to build on what you're talking about, um, John, yeah, they, they never apologize. But they also understand the power of weaponizing true. I mean, wh what do they want you to do more than anything? They want you to confess to your bishop. So they have power over you. So they can, so they can, they can, because they recognize what a, a, a sharp blade it is to be the one who has no confession over the one who does have a confession. It creates an unending power imbalance. And they, of all people, know the power uh, that can be used when you confess to a wrongdoing and they'll never do it. Yeah. Right on. God, All right. So good. All right. You got, you got you, um, I don't know what this means exactly, but Samantha and Kara are both doing, <laughs> doing, 
doing this side. <laughs> I've never been to a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, and you could say, okay, well, well, the the church, it's the they 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 believe and they still teach that the prophet Nielsen is the prophet for the entire world, and that God speaks to him and him alone for all of God's concerns and affairs on this planet. But the the, the church is not like a, a you know a little broke backwood church it owns bonneville um, communication bonneville communication owns television stations radio stations i was going to read down the list of every radio station television station they own the list is out there you can see it if the church wanted to get its message out it has newspapers it has television it has tons of web presence it has radio stations it can get whatever message out that it wants um, but I believe that it enjoys the darkness of the Supreme Court. I've I've enjoyed reading Supreme Court briefings since I was in high school. I, I find them fascinating. Um, and but most people don't share my twisted um, um, view on the world. So it's just going to fly completely over the heads of of almost everybody except wonky people who like this stuff. So the, I think the church knows and they feel like they can just get away with anything in these briefings. And that's why I think it's so important. I love it. Uh, All right. Are we ready to jump into the cases? Yeah, quickly. A uh, huge thanks to Sean Ooh. for the super chat. Sean writes, wow, I'm blown away. So grateful for your hard work, bringing the truth to light. I'm just now truly seeing the church as a capitalist corporation. It looks like anti-capitalism is bringing in the, the, the revenue. So well, this, Love that's, I, I, I want to be clear, you know, because we live in an age of post-truth. I am not making any judgment on capitalism. As a matter of fact, I'm not against capitalism. I just think it's, it is a tool and it has its, it has its benefits and it has its drawbacks. That's yeah. my belief. Okay. Um, the, the idea that I'm some kind of like communist sympathizer is just something that people say because they just don't want to engage these ideas. So the fact that the church functions as a capitalistic organization or functions in a capitalistic system is just, it just is, it's neither good nor bad. I'm, yeah. I'm not, but, but we just have to understand that because of that, we can put a lot of weight in what the church says here, that these things are probably a better way at finding out what the church believes than reading scripture. When's the last time we had a new revelation? Uh, 79 or something like that. I don't, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a while. Does does rolling back a revelation count as a revelation? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, you know, that's been can't, that they they've they've made the definition so squishy that nobody actually knows. No one can say. And isn't that isn't that isn't that the the central irony? You want a reason to leave the church. The whole premise of the church is that we have modern revelation today to lead us in these latter days. But the way the church is structured is such a way that you know nothing. You you can't even tell what the what the church what the church believes you know what what's a restoration what's not what's a doctrine what's not what does the church actually teach no one really knows anymore yeah i was just going to say i was trying to think of the most recent revelation and part of me wanted to say the proclamation of the family number one that hasn't been canonized yet but number two that started out as as like a legal brief as i understand it maybe you're yeah, get... it, it, is, it is actually cited in supreme court cases <laughs> believe it or not which proves our point even more. I was uploading a TikTok in the car driving over here about that today because I was so fired up reading. I was nerding out on amicus briefs today, John Larson. So Excellent. And by the way, this is a great, somebody out there needs to, this was a really hard one to prepare for because there are so, it, it, there are so many tendrils and threads off of this. Someone does need to write a book where they actually go through the, the the wranglings because this is one of the few places where we actually get to shine a light on the political undergirding. Um, the the what is it the 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 population of Utah is about two thirds Mormon, but ninety one percent of the legislature are active Mormons, and um, because the 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 prevailing party in utah um has a super majority they meet in secret this is no they meet in secret even though there's laws that that, that would require political things to happen out in the open because they, they they have that much power they do a lot of things behind closed doors that we have no view into the church has an army i re, i i knew the figure at one time but i i don't remember anymore of lobbyists 
that are just in the Utah State Legislature. I, my understanding is there's more Mormon lobbyists in the Utah State Legislature than any other organization, and they have lobbying firms in in Washington D.C. The 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 church has a lot of fingers in political pies, but normally it's under the cover and you don't get to see what they're actually doing, what they're wrangling until they put it in writing. Yeah. All right. And that's what we're going to talk about today is what have they put in writing? Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm going the, I'm, I'm going to kind of do these incrementally. Um, and I'm going back to 1981. The first case we're going to discuss is 1981. Um, and this is Bob Jones University versus the United States. Um, for a matter of context on this case, um, the church was actively bigoted um, in policy against anybody with um, um, any African American or African blood. Um, th those terms, I'm using their terms, um, um, until 1978. And, and apologists since have always tried to reframe that as a priesthood issue. But let's be clear, um, black men and women were not allowed to pray in churches. Um, black women were not allowed to go to the temple, um, which didn't require any priesthood whatsoever. So, so the, 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 the Hotel Utah required black performers to enter through the back door. And you can go on and on and on and on. The, 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 the church was openly and officially racistly bigoted against people of African descent until 1978. Okay. And there was a lot of stuff that led up to that. And then they, they, they reversed that. Um, are, are, are said anything controversial there? I mean, that's, that's kind of well-known history. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No. So 1981, Bob Jones um, university, Bob Jones university. Um, I don't know what they're doing today, but they always had the reputation of being the most, ultra conservative right wing um, evangelical university in the United States. Um, and um, because of it's it's the way Bob Jones and I, I'm, I'm going to be bouncing back and forth out of language coming from these briefs, um, uh, their interpretation of the Bible regarding interracial dating um, excluded anybody who is black to attend um, um, Bob Jones until 1971. And then from 1971 until 1975, they admitted black students but only if they were married. And after 1975, um, they could, they would allow, um, they, they would um, deny admission to anybody who was in an interracial marriage. So if, if you were a white person married to a black person or a black person married to a white person, you were not allowed to attend um, Bob Jones University. Um, and so, the the Supreme Court or the, the the case was that they wanted to pull their tax exempt status, right? It, it, it all comes back to money all the, all the time. So Bob Jones was not paying any taxes because they were a religious institution. So they ended up in the in the Supreme Court because the the United States tried to pull the the tax exempt status away from Bob Jones University because of their ban on interracial marriage. And um, this is the case that went before the court and was decided in 1981. We should play a game here. Guess which side the church is on. Guess which side the church the church is on this one. Uh, Samantha, you want to guess? The bad one. <laughs> okay. Kara? Um, the, the this is, I'm, I'm going to quote you directly. Oh, go, go ahead, Kara. I'm sorry. Yeah, the one that they've never told us about, you know. I mean, the one against uh, mixed mixed race marriage, because to this day, in the current church curriculum, they still have statements discouraging interracial marriage. And it's mm -hmm. an eternal sin and it always will be. Yeah. And Bednar, president of uh, BYU Idaho in 2003. Something so the, 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 the Mormon church weighs in on this and they say the question, um, the question is not uh, whether we like or dislike the university's policy. This is, this is the church's language. The question is whether the internal revenue service, public servants should have power to grant or deny the lifeline of tax exemption based on what they choose to call public policy. The quotes were there, theirs. Um, then they say this raises questions of fundamental importance to all churches in the United States. It is the admitted public policy of the nation favoring freedom of religion as expressed in the first amendment to be limited by a public policy assuring in the words of a divided United States circuit court that Americans will not be providing indirect support for any educational organization that discriminates on the basis of race. This is what I, this is what I love that the church wrote. This question goes to the heart of the very existence of religious organizations. It has to do with the power to tax as the power to destroy. Mm -hmm. So 
so one can make the argument saying, well, um, you know, most of us would avoid siding with an openly racist organization and you wouldn't want an amicus briefing. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Mr. I'm Mr. Air quotes today. I, I, I apologize. That's kind of douchey. Um, um, you, you wouldn't want an amicus briefing and such, and, you know, just, you just guilt by association. But what's even more sinister is what the church is worried about is that, is that, um, churches can do despicable, terrible things and lose their tax status. It wasn't that the church, they clearly say we're indifferent to their religious policy. The church was worried that bigoted racist universities could lose their tax exempt status because as they say the power to tax is the power to destroy now the church didn't come up with that line that's been around for a long time but that the church would deploy such a line that says that basically saying you trying to make us pay our fair share into society and not have special money privileges no matter what we believe or say that's a tantamount to trying to destroy religion and the religion, the religion has dominance over this, and the will of the people and the will of the United States doesn't matter. If the church wants to have tax-exempt status and wants to do terrible things, the amicus brief clearly states that is the church's position. Yeah, wow. and, you know, the truth is the Mormon church has a history of being a lot more like Bob. I mean, I, to me, Bob Jones University, at least the last I heard about it is one of the most reprehensible universities in the U S from what I know about it. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a really horrible institution. Like I, unfortunately, I think the Mormon church's history is more like Bob Jones university than unlike it, but to give the church even the benefit of the doubt, let's just say the church wasn't a huge fan of the ideology or theology of Bob Jones university. What that definitely shows is that money is money reigns supreme for the church. That's what I'm taking from the church's involvement with that particular brief. Me too. Yeah. Um, and um, for those keeping track at home, uh, Bob Jones lost this case. Um, it was it prevailed that the um, the overall interest of the United States and the First Amendment overrode that, um, and that they could um, the, the government had a real interest in. Um, getting rid of Jones's tax exempt status. Mm, I bet that made the church nervous. All right. Let's go on to the second case. This is Corporation of the Presiding Bishop of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints versus Amos et al. Um, decided in 1987. Um, Apolli, I think is her name. Um, Apolli Mason had been employed at Deseret Gym. Now, um, back in the 70s and 80s, um, there was a gym that was just on the north side of Temple Square. In fact, it's the gym that um, um, Mark Hoffman was at when he came out and sat in his car and accidentally blowed himself up. That was just right outside the, the, the front of this gym, just for those keeping track at home. Um, and um, the church imposed a policy at the time that said every employee of the church has to have a temple recommend. And in this case went all the way to Supreme Court because they said, this is a gym attendant. There is nothing here um, that that um, would allow the church any kind of um, exemption. Now, this is probably a good time to pause and talk about the ministerial exemption. Um, and I don't have case law on this one. I'm sorry, I, I should have been better prepared. But for a long time, there's been um, a political or a, I keep saying political. There's been a governmental view that. Um, the government can't interfere in the selection or discharging of a minister in the church, that the minister of the church is fundamental to a church's identity, and the U.S. government cannot impose any sanction if a church fires a minister. I actually think that's a decent ruling. I mean, because if you think about the if it went the other way, then you could have um, politicians making laws that would define who and how you could set up your, your priesthood or your church leadership. The problem has been, and we're going to run into this more times this evening, is that view keeps getting expanded and expanded and expanded. So in, in this case, um, the church argues that, um, and, and, and by the way, they, they try to get this a class action um, um, lawsuit. I don't know. Um, so, so, so the church argued that they 
obviously have the the ability to decide who works for them and that they are not um, subject to the regular laws of um, fairness and propriety that as a society we have kind of agreed on. The people can't be discriminated based on gender or based on um, religious belief. And I, I find this I find this centrally ir ironic. We're going to get back to this. And this is we need to delve more into what Oaks talks about all the time, because the Oaks view of, of religion and, and by extension, the LDS view of uh, is that the freedom of religion is the freedom for religion to discriminate in ways that people who are not religions do not have. So the church never argues that we shouldn't have like equal protection under the law like of Title IX or in Title VII, like housing, the church oftentimes in their briefs affirms that they believe in that. They just don't believe that those rules should apply to them, that they are a special snowflake, and that, that the laws of common decency and fairness in the United States do not apply to these guys. Okay, does that make sense? Are you guys following along? I, I don't I don't worry. I get too wonky sometimes. No, Samantha. you're the right amount of wonk. I was just texting Joan saying, make sure you turn that bit into a TikTok. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Carrie, you got anything to add? Um, I completely just spaced what we were talking about, but I was listening intently, and I'm not on a phone. <laughs> so the, the the church did win this case, um, and um, they were able to discriminate, which they do to today. So um, I mean, this, this is this example of BYU professors now being more and more required to have active current temple recommends. It's We're going to get there. BYU professors are a different segment of the law. It's like a building block for what eventually, you know, leads up, leads up to what we're seeing today. Right. So, yeah. so, so right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. Yeah. And so right now in the United States, um, religions can in fact discriminate against their, their, their employees when it comes to protected classes, if they can show that that, um, is tied to um, some kind of re religious belief. Um, and it's it's sort of an, an extension of, of that same kind of um, ministerial thing. Uh, if you read the cases, you'll go down the rabbit hole of all the different um, cases that they cite. But um, that's one that the, the, the church won. They, <laughs> that, that, um, and, you know, what, what's, what's, what's ironic here, and I, I want to ground this back in, in truth. Here was a person going to work happily there was no argument that they weren't doing their job well and the church just decides that hey you have to have a temple recommend now that seems you know okay except one of the main requirements to get a temple recommend is uh paying tithing you have to pay 10 percent of your gross income back to the church right right yeah. so you know you, it's hard to make a case that everything's about money for the church but it is kind of intriguing that everything always has a money component um, when it involves the church. Yeah. Okay. Um, Romani well, versus two. Segelstein. So um, number two, again, has a heavy money component. Amicus brief number, number two. It's about control. It's about employees. It's about money. Is that right? Well, yeah, it's about, it's about, we get to decide, you know, they have to have a temple recommend and, Inside a temple recommend, they can ask whatever they want. They can say, do you touch your pee pee? Do you think about naughty things? Do you um, eat the bread every so whatever they want to whatever they want to ask? They can they can ask, and then they can terminate whoever they, they want. And the, the church is a major employer in, in in Salt Lake, so the the church on a whim um, has so, so 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 basically our brothers and sisters who work for the church do not have the basic rights that we as a country that we as a people believe should be guaranteed to all people. Yeah. Uh, my question to that is, uh, if somebody is supposed to have a temple recommend, and if I was a member, I'd be like, great, because I want to make sure everywhere I go that's owned by the church is all really stalwart, awesome members of the LDS church, and they all follow the same rules that I do, and I don't have to encounter a gym member that could possibly look at pornography or, or be something. wearing underwear I'm uncomfortable with. Right? Yes, or just like, I want to be surrounded by other Latter-day Saints. Could that possibly be an argument? Because I don't think a gym member is really going to be paying a lot of tithing. Is it really? I'm just trying to play, you know, devil's I, I don't know. It's another way to say that, Kara, is just what's wrong with wanting to have your employees um, live up to a certain moral or ethical code? Is that also kind of what you're saying? Because other people make me uncomfortable. 
Yeah. And I moved to Utah to not be uncomfortable. Or maybe, or maybe if your employees aren't on drugs or addicted to alcohol or they're not doing things they shouldn't be doing, they'll be more productive workers, maybe. Yeah. Well, and you know, like um who uh could be, is that how you say your name? I apologize. Makes a great point. You know, to go to uh get a temple when you have to go to church. So you have the church literally dictating what people do in their spare time. Um um yeah. you know what 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 they can do in their their free time excellent live. point man live yeah okay all okay. right on the next three. case this is this is uh went to the nevada supreme court um romani versus siegelstein this case is is deplorable and and a lot of these cases just disgusted me the church would even get involved um in this case there um was a synagogue and this uh rabbi followed um, a member of the synagogue out to the parking lot and raped her um, on the on the um, on the grounds that that was not in dispute um what yeah, was in dispute rapes of, of one of the members of his temple yes okay on the on the church grounds in in, in the in the parking lot you have my attention <laughs> oh good god oh, gosh. um and by the way this this case was settled in 2010 we're not talking about like 1950 here <laughs> Um, although the case had been open since 2001, I, I, I do believe that this happened in 2001. Um, so in this case, um, the, the Nevada Supreme court ruled that the two Las Vegas synagogues that, that, you know, there's complexity of who's doing what, but, but, but basically here you have an agent of a religion, um, who is in a, you know, in a, in a religious role on the religious property. Who does something that's despicable, right? So let's uh, turn the page here and find out what the church says about it. So, in an amicus briefing, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints argues that recognized religious institutions cannot be held liable for the sexual abuse of their clergy because of the protection contained in the First Amendment. That's the church's argument that the church itself is not liable for any sexual act that it's its own ministers and agents do because of the first amendment what 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 is in the first i when i think first amendment i think speech I religion think religion but but it's not part of our religion to be able to rape so i'm trying to figure out how they're using the first amendment to protect the right to rape they, they would argue that that the First Amendment protection of religious light rights is infinite. That because the Mormon Church is a religion, they can do whatever they want, and they're protected from it. But what I what I think is really interesting here, because they're going to basically argue the opposite here coming up, and we get to talk about what it means to be a minister in the in the Mormon Church. But but. They're saying out, out of this side of their mouth in this case that even though you're a minister of the church, the church is not liable for you. So, so again, let's go back to what I said in the preamble. The church acts like a corporation. Who is the church? Well, it's not the membership because they've shown in legal cases they'll go after the membership and they'll excommunicate them. And now it's not even the clergy because they're saying if you are clergy and you do this, we're still protected because we have our first amendment religious rights. All right, Carrie, you had a comment. Yeah. Is this just like the same similar theme that we see, you know, with the, the uh, associated press article recently as well, just like every, as long as they can just defer the blame to an individual and not hold the church because the religion is just too massive that the religion will always get its freedom of speech. It's will always get its freedom to choose its, you know, whether it's as pastors, it's bishops, it's stake presidents, whatever it may be within the religion, it always gets the right to choose that. And you can never actually uh, like hold any claims that will stick against the LDS church. Is that what their point is by saying freedom of speech? Yeah. The church is ephemeral. Like, like, and, and we see outside the legal realm, them doing this all the time, disavowing what, um, you know, the prophets of the church have said, disavowing what the church has, has written, disavowing scripture, because the church is not any of those things. Well, if it's not its doctrine and if it's not its clergy and it's not its membership, what is it? Well, I told you at the beginning of the hour, it's a corporation Yeah, and, and it exists as a corporation and it uses the protection that religious corporations have in order to um, assert its rights. 
Yeah. And just echoing on the point I wanted to make earlier in this program is that it's a corporation. And if people are so desperate, everybody wants, you know, spiritual fulfillment. What do we, what's after this life? How do my family be together? Like, where do I look for morality? And you get that from the Mormon church that you just described. That's where you're getting your utmost spiritual fulfillment. That's where I go make covenants. That's what the clothing that I buy from the church to put on my body for its underwear. Everything when I was Mormon, I wish I would have known these types of things of like, this is the spiritual leaders. These are the people that hold the keys when it's really just lawyers behind the curtain that I'm getting all of this fulfillment from. And uh, jokes on them. I got a lot more on my own. Sorry, guys. I can do it without you. Well, also buried in this case, I mean, good points, Kara. Also buried in this are the fact, like, what? This, none of this had anything to do with the church. Why was the church even monitoring this? Like, like, why would they even care? Like, that's like, um, yeah, go ahead. I'm just saying that's spooky. Why are they monitoring? Let's look out for other clergy members who are raping, and let's write some uh, amicus briefs on that, uh, just to make sure that if one of our guys. Not like protecting children, not like putting uh, uh, any kind of uh, orders in place and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Background checks in place. They're busy writing these briefs to make sure if uh, their guys go a raping that they won't have to face the music. Is that what's kind of going on here? I feel like it. I mean, so, it, it, yeah, I want to get Sam in here, but it it has to be that they're, they're thinking, wow, we've had a lot of bishops abusing members. We want to mm -hmm. be protected. So let's let's pile on here and make sure that we can avoid a bunch of lawsuits because we've got, we'll, we have these problems too. Samantha, why don't you jump in? Well, if I climb into my believing Mormon brain on this one, I think, well, why should the church be liable for, you know, a Mormon bishop doing something that is decidedly against Mormonism's code of conduct? Like why should, and obviously it, it feels much more sinister having the context of the way that the church protects abusers but thinking of it through a believing lens yeah why why should the church be held accountable for bad apples that aren't doing something that's in line with mormonism like or is am i am i understanding the case right is it is it deeper than that no it's a great question but i have an answer for it the code of conduct and behaviors that are issued to the bishops are done in secret and the church specifically forbids members for having it and releasing it, or they did in the past. I, I never know what the church is doing today. Um, so the church handbook of instruction that tells bishops what to do was specifically instructed to keep out of the hands of the membership. Um, the, that's argument number one. Argument number two, the church has no channel for um, reporting bad conduct. So because of the way the church has structured its organization, the membership has no mechanism whatsoever to differentiate between when a bishop is acting as the agent of the church and a bishop who's acting on his own behalf. So be, be, because of that, because that, that data is secret and specifically withheld, I would think that that shows a nefarious intent. Yeah. Now, um, uh, how the case was decided, the Supreme Court unanimous decision written by Chief Justice Michael Douglas said the synagogue and rabbis cannot be held liable um, for um, Stegelstein's intentional conduct as it was outside the scope of Stegelstein's duties. Mm. And, and again, um, just what I said, in the Mormon church, we don't know what the duties of a bishop are. They don't say. I, I'll just say really quickly that, you know, one of the things I was taught as a eight-year-old Mormon boy is that the church, you know, one of the articles of faith is we believe in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. Sustaining the law, that means like supporting it and upholding it. What this what this amicus brief tells me uh, is that the church wants to do everything it can to be above the law, to not be tied down by the law, and to do everything it can to escape any legal culpability. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I think, um, and we're going to go through more cases. I think if you're going to sum them up, it's that. The U.S. law, the and, and 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 it's more than just law. Like the the idea of equal protection under the law is not just legal wrangling. It is one of the core values of of the United States, the 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 place that I love, and I think that is an important advancement in human in human history, equal protection under the law. And what what the church um, again and again and again argues is that they can break the laws of the land because they are an entity unto themselves 
and the 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 will of the people has no bearing on them. Yeah. Yeah, and the sentence that comes to mind right now is just this idea that the church thinks in in the, the way that they strategize this whole thing is that they can do things without any kind of ramifications and with impunity. And you know, you're in a system that has, you know, women, children, men all who feel like they have to be there. Like there's no, there's no system in which like you, you're just allowed to just take your kids out of the church and still be a believing member and just not attend. You're not a believing member. You're not living up to your covenants. So the church, you're, you're forced to put your kids in situations and your family in situations where the very church that they feel forced to go to can act with impunity, but your children don't have a choice. Your children and your wife and your family or your whole family breaks up and everything goes to shit. You know, your whole family is, is blown to pieces if you don't act in accordance with what they want. But when it comes to like them actually paying the piper and, uh, you know, people actually going to jail and people needing to pay these giant lawsuits, like we've seen the church will do everything in their power to not actually pay the piper. But it's, it's, all of that that pain and that trauma is just passed down to the members themselves. That's my point. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share a comment from B. Dan. He writes, this is why the penitent privilege thing is a linchpin. It makes the covering up key to the traditional religious practice. Um, so thanks, Dan. I think that really is important. The, the priest penitent privilege is, is, again, another instance where the church wants to avoid any uh, culpability. And I think that was demonstrated in the episodes we did with Tim Kosnoff and the AP article by um, Mike Resendez. I also just want to say, isn't it weird that it's, it's the United States of America that's protecting religions and religious freedom. And yet churches don't have to pay in to support that infrastructure. Why, why is it if, if the, if the country does such a great job protecting these religious institutions that they shouldn't want to chip in to help sustain financially the 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 country that that helps them thrive i mean we are the most churchy we're definitely one of the most churchy developed countries in the world why why should we be giving religions a tax exemption when we're growing them and building them and helping them be successful anyway that's a side note tangent but i think it's excellent questions brother Dylan. yeah Okay, and uh, we're going to skip ahead a few years to the infamous um, Obergefell versus Hodges. Um, um, Obergefell, I've heard of that one. Uh, probably the most, uh, 2015, um, one of the most consequential cases for the church. Um, to let uh, refresh your memories a little bit, um, at this time, um, uh, Obama was in office and had passed the DOMA Act, the Defense of Marriage um whatever. And, um, and the church, um, got involved in California prop politics in prop eight. And, um, during prop eight leading up to this, um, the, the, the church overextended its hand several times, got caught in more than one lie, um, got caught busing people around and, and, and doing things. Um, the church was full on, um, this is well documented. Even people like Steve Young, ended up making comments against the church because the church was using its um, religious networks to um, ask. There's many members who left the church over, over this case, including um, my dear wife. Um, so, so there were people in California who walked away because they were getting callings to go canvas in, um, for Prop 8. And um, the church um, passed a the church had, or the state of Utah, had been one of the places that, that defined marriage as uh, a man and a woman. Um, and it is those cases that eventually got overturned in um, Obergefell. Um, so in, on June 26, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court, by a 5-4 to four margin, ruled that state bans on same-sex marriage, on recognized same-sex marriages, duly performed in other jurisdictions, have to be recognized in any state. So for a long time, there'd been a legal principle, which is an important to the foundation of the United States of America, that the legal contracts and um, binding agreements as you enter into one state are um, binding when you cross boundaries. So like if you get married in California and you drive into, into Nevada, your marriage is still legal. That has been a longstanding principle. And it started to break down in the early part of the last decade as um, states were saying, we will not recognize the marriages of other states. 
And the Supreme Court, by a five to four margin, said, nope, if somebody gets married legally in any state, then those marriages are legal everywhere, thus um, um, decriminalizing um, gay marriage. A very uh, wonderful day. I still remember um, the, the day that that ca case came about, um, the, the lawyers, the, there was a, a, a phone tree that, that went out because we knew we had a window. We had a short window of time as we were rushing people to the to the courthouse, and it, it was it was a, it was a beautiful day in Salt Lake. Um, I was involved in I was involved in a little bit as we were rushing people around and getting them down to the courthouse to get them married. The the worry is that the the doors would open and they would slam back closed. They haven't yet, but um, I believe the Supreme Court is taking up this issue again this session, and we'll see what happens in um, in the spring. But wonderful, wonderful day. Beautiful job. Okay. And did you so, tell us where the church came down on its amicus brief? <laughs> no. Um, and in this one, I, I'm, I'm choosing. I'm choosing to read actually from the the church's newsroom. They did file an amicus brief, and they they had their fingerprints all over this nationally and locally. So much money, and it has been argued that if the church had not got involved in this, it may not have ever come to pass. So the church has a direct hand in making sure we have a marriage equality today, which we do. Um, so I'm going to read you. Um, um, this is from the church newsroom. If you go search um, um, Obergefell versus Hodges and like Latter-day Saint, it's one of the top things you come up with. It's still up there today. Um, it was this afternoon. The church says yet. As explained in the amicus brief, the legislation of same-sex marriage across the country does far more than grant same-sex couples the right to the same benefits as heterosexual married couples. By redefining what marriage has been for most of human history, the court will impede the ability of religious people to participate fully as equal citizens in American civil life. The courts will impede the ability of religious people to participate fully if Gary marries Steve, according to the church, you are impeding their ability to fully participate as a, as a Mormon. I'm, I'll ask faithful Mormons, how has your worship of the Mormon God in Mormon churches with the Mormon priesthood been impeded by gay marriage? That's what the church says will happen. So it's been it's been six years, right? We should have it well documented now how the church's mission on earth has been impeded by well, we we know we know one. I guess I if I think about it, we'll answer my own question. The November 5th uh, travesty where they um stopped um allowing baptisms for a short time of children, innocent children, um, who had only the sin of having gay parents. Um, and if you'll remember, the church demanded that these kids um uh condemn their 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 parents in order to join the church right yeah uh speaking as somebody who was a conservative mormon three years ago who went and helped put on speeches at the un uh fighting for a traditional marriage with Elanis dalton and uh, byu conservative professors on marriage and family and then your your old nuance ho carabrell over there i have some sins to repent of and my position three years ago was the, in my head. I didn't say this publicly because this is not like <laughs> that helpful. If people now this is safe. It's not that helpful for people who don't believe the same things that you do, but in Mormon conservative circles, the idea was that God is sending down these beautiful babies down and we need to them to be in as many heterosexual families as possible. Not all of them are going to be Mormon and sealed in the temple, but at least they will have the promise of one day being sealed in the afterlife. But if they come down and they live with, uh, and you know, they get adopted into, uh, gay families or uh, through surrogacy, then that will destroy the family and that will destroy people's ideals of what a traditional family looks like. And there goes the Mormon church and there goes our entire country hanging by a thread all because these little babies in heaven, these sweet, sweet spirits need to be uh, like Saturday's warriored down into Mormon heterosexual they families. A mother and a father. Yeah. That was my position three years ago. Yeah. Here I am and JC, on the other side. JC writes, uh, Kara's conversion gives me hope. Yeah, I have. I did not want to have to admit some of my old opinions, but that is who I used to be. Yeah. 
unfortunately. Kara, that's who I used to be too. Um, I mean, that's who we all used to be, right? Um, we don't sit and and um, point fingers at Mormons and say, ha, 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 how stupid you are. In only as much as we were all stupid, we were all um, taken in by, 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 by this. So I don't think anybody should feel shame that they were raised in, in a home that taught them things that they later realized were wrong. I think we should learn to honor and respect those who can change their opinions. Um, I'm just curious, Samantha, I don't even know the answer to this question and I've known you for a while. Were you ever sort of like pro traditional family, anti same sex marriage? I don't even know this about you. Well, I didn't, I, I grew up very pro LGBTQ. Um, but when I became Mormon, it, yeah, it did warp my thinking. I did become pretty anti-gay. I mean, I, it was, you know, the idea of like, uh, it's only a sin if you act on it. And I think I had a bit, a bit more perspective maybe than someone who grew up in a Mormon family where I didn't, it didn't feel quite as heinous, you know, the idea of gay people raising children. It, it didn't alarm me that much, but yeah, the church did, did erode my thinking there and, and make me homophobic. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing. That's super cool. I, my, my, <laughs> my, super cool. my thought in reaction to the church's involvement in same sex marriage is just kind of, it's, it's a thought of hypocrisy that, you know, the church knows what it's like to be discriminated against for the, the types of marriages that it held sacred in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. And back then it was screaming bloody murder that the state, meaning the U S federal government would step in and try to micromanage what people's, what, what people conceived as being their sacred families or their sacred unions. So it feels hypocritical a hundred or whatever, how many years later for the church to flip and, and be basically making the legal arguments that a hundred years previous, um, you know, it, it was fighting and the church has a long enough memory to remember it has enough scars and, and, a, and a good enough memory to remember what its position used to be. And so I do think that's just kind of like blatantly hypocritical for the church not to go, Hey, we know what it's like to be told what is and isn't a legitimate family. So we're not, we're not going to turn around and do that to other people. But that logic is more advanced than the church has. Cause it's the juvenile way of thinking is just like, no, our way is the right way. It's they're not looking at it through the lens of like, oh, comparable phenomenons. It's just like <laughs> our way is the right way. We don't give a shit how you try and tie these things together. They're not the same in our mind. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, for me personally, it come from, comes from a place of ignorance of just, and I don't mean ignorance in a bad way of just, yeah, a lot of, a lot of whitewashed history, a lot of things that you don't realize about your own history. We had, like I said, my, my, my video on my Nuance Ho channel with Eve, my friend in here about asking her how many wives did Joseph Smith have? And this idea like that the proclamation to the family is trotted out in these um, amicus briefs and the church has to have this certain language showing that if they have a vested interest in, um, and the, and the outcome of these cases. And they need to prove that by showing like, see, we've always believed in traditional marriage. See, it says right here in the proclamation from our God, you're not allowed us allowed to like, not let us file this amicus brief on this. You know, I'm saying amicus and amicus interchangeably because they are just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that I'm hyper aware of those things. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, the church is allowed to like, you know, prop these things up that we've always believed these things. And they need to have really firm language. Like we're reaffirming our values when gay marriage wasn't even talked about before like the 1970s. And they just kind of want to have what jo John always likes to say the droids you're not like the droids you're you're looking for are not found here that but with different words <laughs> just the church needs to have this uh this whitewashed version of history that I didn't know about if I would have known that Joseph Smith uh we have no right to be talking about traditional marriage and fidelity within marriage when Joseph Smith had 22 women that he was sealed to before, you know, Emma, that he was banging, like those things would have been important to understand that the, the, the overall context of what my church believes in now and supports now is completely removed from the history and what it's been up to. Elder Oaks himself is saying that in you know, the marriage is about a uh, procreation and he's allowed to marry a second wife along with Russell Allen Nelson. They're not doing any procreating. And so it's, yes, it's this hypocritical nature, but it's also just as a member, you're just following. These are my spiritual leaders. These are the people who know what's best for me um, without taking in any of the other context about why 
they're actually doing these things yeah. in the history. I love it. Uneducated I was. Yeah. You, you guys all have great points, but you're being way, way, way too generous. John, you saying the church is hypocritical and Sam, you saying the church is juvenile. Too generous. They're <laughs> fucking liars. Let's read again that paragraph, shall we? Or at least the last sentence. By redefining what marriage has been for most of human history, the court will impede the ability of religious people to participate fully as equal citizens in American civil life. Let's pull that apart, shall we? In China, there is the practice of polygamy. There has been polygamy practiced in China for thousands of years. In India, there is the practice of polygamy. They've been practicing polygamy for thousands of years. In Africa, there is the practice of polygamy. They've been practicing polygamy for thousands of years. What were the marital practices of the Mayans, of the Aztec, of the Phoenicians, of the Babylonians? I don't think the Mormon lawyers actually know. They are stating a bald face lie. And the only way to make their statement make any sense is if you insert the word white in it to it. By redefining what white marriage has been for most of white history, then it makes sense. They are racist and they're dismissive of people they don't care about, um, which, I mean, the Indian civilization is the oldest or one of the oldest civilizations dating back thousands of years of, of, of um, brilliant, philosophical, scientific, governmental, human progress. And the church routinely ignores that billion plus people who live that religion today and its rich and fascinating history. They will get in front of you and say with a straight face, our definition of marriage, even though we know, as you guys brought up, that it hasn't been their definition of marriage ever, because like Kara pointed out in 2000, either three or five, Oaks declared very clearly that both of his wives, the one who had passed away, the one he's married to, were his eternal companions. It is unambiguous that the church believes in polygamy today and that most of the world has engaged in alternative marital arrangements to what these guys are saying are traditional. This are, these are white supremacist dog whistles. And to believe that the way that the Protestant Americans behaved, even ignoring the Mormons of the, of the past, is just either, either plain ignorance, but the, the church is not a dummy. It is an outright lie. It is not traditional to say that a man and a woman are married. Um, any anthropologist will tell you that. There are hundreds of different forms of marriage pl played on the earth today and have been for all time, as best as we can tell. There is no fundamental marriage that society is built on. That is bogus. That is a lie. The church was able to have huge economic growth underneath polygamy. And 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 whatever they're saying, it is, it is just um, baloney. But there's more baloney. Go ahead, John. So really quick, John, uh, like if I had to think, like if I had to think about the defining issue in Mormonism for the past 30 years, and Kara, this is a nod back to when Oaks kind of took his position as an apostle. It's almost like, it's almost like the church said, uh oh, we're getting in trouble in Hawaii with this gay marriage stuff. And uh oh, Boston and maybe Vermont's getting a little bit too cozy and, and Canada's starting to look like they're going to, you know, the gay menace is growing. Let's get an expert in legal stuff into the Quorum of the Twelve and let's have his chief responsibility of his life as an apostle be fighting the gay menace. Enter Dallin H. Oaks. He writes the, the memo that you referenced. Principles Kara. to govern possible public statement on legislation affecting rights yeah. of homosexuals. And it basically, it is just him talking as a lawyer and also as an apostle to tell the other uh, top leaders of the church that when we need to talk about gay marriage, these are the angles, this is the strategies that we need to go with. It's pathetic. And you can read it online. I'll and, post it later. And it's and it's it's uh, it's a photocopy of like type typed out text. So you can actually see that a typewriter... <laughs> typed it out and you can hear down a jokes his voice the homosexual in the mormon you know really strong impression is that good yeah. is that pretty good thank you um no but but uh if i had to think about like where is the you know john your whole premise of this episode is amicus brief shows what the church cares about if i had to pick one thing that the church seems to care the most about over the past 30 years it's gonna be fighting same-sex marriage because like 
how many decades did we go where every general conference talk, Packer or Oaks or whoever would always have to say traditional marriage, marriage between a man and a woman, you know, to the point where when do we have any evidence of the church actually trying to lobby at a state level to take a basic human right away from, from you know, free citizens of a sovereign state where the church, like, got BYU students to fill up call banks and literally phone in to influence the election of a sovereign state and to pay 40, 80, however many millions of dollars to get involved in a civil matter. Like, what other issue has the church shown that level of care and involvement, it's on fighting gay marriage, and it's not done. It's Oaks is giving his musket talk, and 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 the honor code. They're still BYU, still at fighting the gays, and it's it, the church is kind of it's sinking the church. And John Larson, this is a long way of asking kind of a question. I remember when you ended Mormon expression, you kind of threw down the gauntlet and made a pretty strong statement about the Mormon church and uh, this issue of of LGBTQ members. That they'll and, die on this hill. Yeah. And I just, you know, if we had to theorize, you might be muted. If we had to theorize um, why the church is ready to die on this hill, do we have theories about why the church is wanting to die on this hill? Of all the hills, it's not legalization of marijuana. It's not protecting child abusers or child child abuse victims it's not water it's not starvation it's not homelessness it's literally trying to destroy the lgbt lifestyles and 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 lgbtq love why let's go around the horn john larson you start well i i think, I think there's two parts here um and there is and we can find the link there's one of the last mormon expression episodes I, I, I make that argument in depth. So there's a whole episode where, where I kind of explain. But in, in brief, you start pulling on that thread um, and everything falls apart. Because um, first of all, once you recognize gay marriage in the church and fully recognize gay marriage in the church, you allow two men to marry. Uh, once you allow two men to marry and adopt and seal, then women in the church have zero value. They have no value anymore because women are valued in the church um, for the reproductive and, and sexual value. And that's, that's the, I said, there's two parts. The other one that I want to push back on you, there is another issue that the church, um, fights as hard with, and that's the sexual, um, subordination of women to the church and its church authority. And that happens both in terms of what bishops tell women, how we treat women in, in marriage, how we treat them and call everything they do in the church an auxiliary and don't allow them any real leadership and how the lawyers, um, deal with, um, with, um, um, sexual um, confession of women, things as simple as if a woman confesses adultery um, to her bishop, um, then the bishop can do whatever he wants in terms of disciplining her. Um, but if a man confesses the same thing, then it has to go because he's a priesthood holder. It has to go to a council of 15 men. Um, you know, so so I would say that the subjugation and sexually sex, psychosexual subjugation of women is still on par with um, with gay marriage. And honestly, yeah, I stand corrected because in my lifetime, the church fought the Equal Rights Amendment and definitely lobbied and lobbied as hard to, to kill the Equal Rights Amendment as they did Prop 8. But you look at this case that's got um, um, juice in, in Arizona, um, where, you know, which is it's it's been around. I, I pulled an article um, in my research from 2019, an expose. I think it was done by Vice talking about how. Uh, you know, people are reporting sexual abuse inside the church and um, it goes straight to Curtin and McConkie. And, you know, that's that's been well established in case anybody doesn't know if uh, the bishops are given the instruction is if somebody um, confesses, you know, um, internal sexual abuse, then you're supposed to call this number. But that number runs straight to Curtin and McConkie and it's completely about legal protection. And that's what this case that's that's rising up through the courts right now is is about. So. Um, I, I think that the church uses sexuality, among other things, to control people. So, so um, it, it seems like gay marriage is, is, its, is its 
focal point like you're suggesting. And I think that's just because it's in the zeitgeist. It's what we're dealing with socially right now. But really, the church pursues and and claims ownership over anything that makes its membership feel broken because they sell snake oil. Remember what I've what I've always said. The church takes everything from you and then tries to sell it back from you. The church is going to tell you you're broken. The church is going to tell you you need the saving grace of Jesus. And by the way, we're the only ones who can give it to you, and it costs 10% and then all this other stuff. The church is a corrupt, disgusting um, aberration on humanity that uses the common um, struggles that we as humans have to subjugate people and to turn them into psycho psychological slaves. I, I can't say it any more clearly. The church wants you broken. And if it can break you because you're gay, it can break you because you're horny, it can break you because you, you're you addicted to something, anything, it will use that to wield power over you. Tara? Um, I, think it's, I think it's simple. I think it's right in front of our faces. I think that homosexuality, uh, the church has tried to prove that it's not an inborn tendency and they've gone to all of the extremes that they can. And I think that we do know that homosexuality is a normal inborn tendency and we see it all across the animal kingdom. Uh, we have a prophet that doesn't believe in evolution. So the church is just anti-science and it's anti-best uh, practices, psychologically speaking. And so I just think that homosexuality proves the church wrong and they're doing everything that they can in their power mm -hmm. um, to snuff it down. Um, and that's what I mean by people should really go read that proposition paper in 1984. It's the exact same things you will hear all across like conservative, evangelical, all those same spaces about the strategies of how do we demonize gay people? How do we keep them out of um, talking to our kids? We can't make them teachers. We can't make them coaches because that will normalize it. And if we normalize gay people, people will start to think, oh, I have a gay friend and they were just born that way. And that will go against the teachings of our church that God created one man, one woman. Their genders are the exact ones that God put in their body. And anything different than that will disprove our church. And uh, in the 1970s, Oaks formed a, a, the Values Institute, which its intended confirmed, its intended um, uh, reason for being set up uh, was to prove the church's biases about homosexuality correct and ever since then they can't they can electroshock the crap out of gay people and you can't you can't pray away the gay you can't electroshock the gay gay away um and homosexual people exist they always will and then i just think of people like the lang family in here um kelly lang the second that he realized that his son was gay and he came up to him he went the church is false he immediately said, if my son is gay, I know this person like so well, they served a mission. They were the most righteous person I could ever imagine. If this person's telling me they've done everything they could to try to pray the way the gay in an instant, he says the church isn't true. And the church is scared as hell of more people doing that. Amen. Beautiful. Sammy. John, oh, oh, John, Sam, just for a second, Sam. get Sammy in and then we'll come back. Yeah. You can go first if you need no, 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 to. go ahead. Well, I mean, I think you guys have really summed it up well, but it's like humans exist somewhere on a spectrum of how willing they are to tolerate uncertainty and i feel like in high demand religions people uh, flock more to these rigid ideologies these rigid like frameworks that they're unwilling to question and i mean i've seen this recently like that people leave mormonism mormonism is obviously a huge one but then outside of that it's like monogamy patriarchy like there are frameworks in the brain that, that like will continue to exist even after someone leaves Mormonism and I just feel like yeah for all the reasons you guys have just said like embracing homosexuality is just something that that cannot be done because it's it it threatens too much of those core frameworks in their brain you know like patriarchy yeah one one piece of the Jenga tower comes out the whole thing will fall down and that's how a lot of it was like I started to realize that I know too many gay people and they didn't choose this, but my church is saying the other one. Okay, if they're not right about homosexuality, are they not right, not right about patriarchal structures? Are they not right about like word of wisdom? Are they not right about a million different things? And a lot of, again, conservative values are all tied up in those things. And that's why deconstruction is just like a lifelong process. You start untangling yourself from what you thought was truth that you got from these spiritual sources. And then you take the curtain, you're like, oh, lawyers are telling me this. All right, well, this Jenga tower is coming down. I got to sort out these pieces. Well, yeah, and as one or all of you said, like sexual shame is like a primary tool of control for high demand religions. And um, I've just lost my point as I started talking out loud. I was just going to say, think about it, Samuel. <laughs> oh, I was going to oh, go say, ahead. like, if people, if you've been so wired to associate homosexuality with 
um, you know, sexual perversion, whatever. Like you're wired to feel disgust and disgust is a very powerful emotion, you know, that is like very hard to get away from. And they've done studies showing that conservative people feel disgust more easily than liberal people. Like it's a disgust is a primary tool of control as well. This is righteous mind, Jonathan Haidt stuff you're talking about. Yeah, not that I'm necessarily saying conservatives are more controlled than liberals. I was just using that as an example. Yeah. Really quickly, let me give a shout out to Mike B. He writes, the extreme political right is pushing for Christian nationalism. Church members, in my opinion, are trained nationalists and they don't even know it. I'll just add that the, the <coughs> New York Times podcast, The Daily, uh, just in the past week or two, did a really, really fascinating episode on the the emergence of christian nationalism over the past 10 years i forwarded to, to patrick mason i loved it so much um i also want to give a shout out to jake clark i think jake is a former mormon stories podcast interviewee jake says tacos <coughs> to share and he flies the, the rainbow flag i think that yeah, might jake. be a, that might be a Kara reference um yeah. Okay. Uh, John Larson. Well, let's get, oh, Sammy. Yeah. I also think, sorry if I'm being a dead horse, but gay people threaten gender roles. And I feel like gender roles are almost like a big source of comfort. Again, coming back to that human's ability to tolerate uncertainty. It's like just in a world where nothing is certain and there, you know, you find your own meaning and it's like, it's very comforting to feel like, Oh, this is, this is what I should be. Someone has already laid out a blueprint. Humans love a blueprint. And I just have to do that. And if I just do that to the best, then I'll be doing a good job. And I, and I think threatening that and sort of just like we humans don't want options in a lot of ways. And it's like scary to expand the number of options that people might have available to them. Cause I think, so many people are so afraid to question any of their deeply held beliefs because well obviously right we're wired to protect them at all costs and yeah. inviting any expansion whatsoever threatens your perceived sense of self and yeah it's summarized. and then it's like if they're rigidly adhering if gender roles are so important to them and they've been taught their whole lives that they're so important they're the people that are going to rail the hardest against people who choose not to adhere to them because it brings up this thing of like, well, then why have I been doing this my whole life? You know, people are the most annoyed when you break rules that they falsely believe are fixed realities. I think we should let John Larson talk. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was going to say something. I was going to say something. And I'm I didn't. enjoying. Go ahead, Kara. Okay. I just feel like we haven't brought you in in a while. Um, the only thing I was going to add to that is I think about how simplistic it is uh, in the church when you just want to say like, uh, the church is true. And you just repeat that over and over again. You know, that that's your testimony and testimony meeting. That's all you really need to know. The church is true. The book is blue, those kinds of repeated phrases. But I wanted to echo again what Samantha was saying on her lovely point. And I was not trying to be disrespectful. I was trying to not talk myself because I wanted to bring John in. But what Sam was saying is so true, because I think there is the simplicity of being in the church. And then you have to have on the opposite end. That's why Mormon stories episodes are so long. That's why deconstruction takes so long is because you have so many books you need to read so many layers of nuance that it takes a long amount of time. It takes a lot of emotional fortitude to get through understanding and learning and empathizing. That is a lot larger and broader of a road that fewer people choose to travel along than just saying mm, church is true, gender roles, specific blueprint. Um, I'm just going to stay over here in this nice little place. Uh, but all of that is just, Anything that takes that that layered amount of thinking, the church does, I believe, wants to shut down and doesn't want to encourage. They want to keep you um, staying yes in that rigidity that is yeah. that is just for their benefit. It's not for your spiritual benefit whatsoever. It's not for your intellectual development. Yeah, maybe a way to summarize this whole little section is this famous Boyd K. Packer quote that was made probably before you guys were born, where Boyd K. Packer comes to BYU or whatever and says the three great threats to the Mormon church are the gays, the feminists, and the intellectuals. Right. He, li he literally said that. They make us think. They make <laughs> me feel bad for not unloading the dishwasher. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. All right, John Larson, let's bring you back, brother. Fantastic. Wonderful points. Thank you guys um, um, so much. I, uh, uh, you know, it's it's heartfelt. I, I want to move on, but there's one more gem in um, Obergefell that we have to bring up. And I'm going to go back to, in this case, the amicus briefing the church wrote. Um, and they have this gem in there. The Constitution marks a wiser course by leaving the people free to decide the great marriage debate through their state democratic institutions, allowing all citizens an equal voice in shaping their common destiny is the only way 
the diverse views of a free people can be respected on this matter of profound political, social, and religious importance. I defy anybody to show me anything in Mormon doctrine, ancient or modern, that would justify that statement. And I will call out the full-on hypocrisy of them saying that states should have the right to decide this decision after the Utah-based LDS Church did a full frontal campaign in California to get Prop 8 overturned, or to get get Prop 8 voted down. And it's a bald-faced hypocrisy because the church is constantly lobbying for um, national law and national protection. If they really believe this, then they would be saying all the time that the, the, the feds should not be involved in this. This should be a state's issue. Now, we can even attack and go after the, the logical um, nut job of the argument that it is that somehow that that having a state decide thing where we know states have been more involved in gerrymandering and other nefarious things, um, why that, how, in whatever world, that means the state reflects more the will of the people than the nation. No one's made that argument. But again, let's talk about dog whistles. Since the, since the Civil War, racism and white, Um, superiority, white supremacy has always, always, always gone to the argument of states' rights. And and that was was the um, false flag operation of the Confederacy Um, um, because they really weren't ever after that. And and had the Confederacy um, survived, they would, well, it's conjecture. I won't even make that argument. Um, But um, that it's it's it just shows the hypocrisy of the organization and how they are in bed with white supremacists. They use the arguments all the time. This is commonly used by the right to to you know they'll 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 on on one point. And I'm talking the radical right will on one point argue that Roe versus Wade, for example, should be overturned to be a state's right issue. Then immediately start the national campaign to, to get a, a, a national anti-abortion law passed. So the church is engaged in full frontal hypocrisy here, and they have no grounds or no bearing to make such an argument. And I just think that it shows what the church is really after, which is power, which is political power and not any kind of doctrinal um, consistency. All right, John. Thank you. All right. That was good. Let's go to the next. Should we go to the next amicus brief? We shall. Masterpiece Cakes Limited. Uh, at all versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission 2018 case. This is a case that should be recent on your mind. Masterpiece Cakes um, was a cake shop in Colorado that um, I think two gay men came in and asked for a wedding cake and Masterpiece Cakes refused um, to make the cake on religious grounds. Um, they said, hey, we don't um, we don't have to. It's free speech for us. The, the, the basic argument was my free speech can mean I can discriminate openly and freely against anybody who doesn't share my religious beliefs or even more sinister. My religious beliefs allow me to discriminate people based on intrinsic characteristics of, of my neighbor because I believe those intrinsic characteristics have a connotation, i.e. sin. So if I declare something that you do sinful, I am free in the United States to defy equal protection under the law. John, your um, your mic just uh, your mic just ditched for a second. There, I think it's- oh, okay. Are we back? Yeah, you're back now. I think. Um. So 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 again, that that the gist of the case is that um, they're arguing that their religious beliefs um, allow them to call anything that anybody does sin, and if I call one of your behaviors sinful, then I can discriminate against you and um, ignore the equal protection of the law and I can deny you services. That was the um, fundamental argument of Masterpiece Cakes. Okay. All right, so who's who? do you want to guess whose side the church is on in this one? Oh, uh, we're going to like Pro discrimination. Yay, we love to discriminate. It's our favorite thing ever. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, and seven other organizations um, filed an amicus brief Um by the way, um, the on a seven-two decision, the 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 courts um, said that uh, um, Masterpiece Cakes was out of line, but this 
this is coming back up to the courts. We're probably going to revisit this issue again, probably this term. Um, so this is from the amicus brief. But some deeply religious Americans, including some of um, um, amicus members, cannot in good conscience assist with same-sex weddings. Now that the court has protected the liberty of same-sex couples, it is equally important to protect religious liberty of those conscientious objectors. Belief in basic fairness for all. <laughs> the church has openly encouraged and participated in legislative efforts to secure essential rights for LGBT citizens while protecting religious freedom. Again, if you look and see what they're, they're, they're defining, that they say their religious freedom gives them the right to refuse to participate in civil society. Yeah. It's almost like nowadays, whenever you hear the Mormon church talk about religious freedom, you can almost guarantee what they're going to say next is we want to discriminate against somebody. And, uh, you know, there was a really good comment that was just made, um, that basically said, how would the church feel if you, businesses were allowed to discriminate against Mormons based on their religion. So the church is okay discriminate for businesses discriminating against same-sex married couples, but would they flip that around and be okay with businesses discriminating against them on the basis of religion? Maybe not. They'd be like, free market capitalists, just go open another place down the street where you then compete with the non-shelling to Mormons bakery store. They'd just be like, free market all day. Well, and we don't have the time in this um, podcast to read the entire amicus brief, but I will let you know that you can go read them. If you want to call me a liar, just go look at it yourself. That the church oftentimes makes that case in a preamble to whatever bullshit they're about to say. They say, oh, we really, really believe in rights and everyone should have equal access. But equal access to us, or as, as you were hinting, John, their belief is that their religious rights mean that they can do whatever they want. Um, and ignore the rights that they demand outside of the religious sphere. It just it just makes me feel like the the like I'm not anti-religious, but it seems like the United States has gone too far, coddling and upholding and protecting religions where they're not paying taxes. They can live and exist above the law, like Scientology, one of the most heinous organizations in the history of the United States, they were able to successfully sue the IRS and, and put the IRS sort of in terror. And I just, I just think we give way too much religious protection in this country. Well, I, I agree. I, I think that it should be taken out of the constitution in part from what you're saying, because we already have the right to free speech. We already have the right to assemble. We already have the right of the free press. So, so what, else do you need and the, the answer according to dallin oaks is you get the right to discriminate but but here legally i or philosophically i would suggest that if you say believing joseph smith the prophet is a protected religious belief then i would say from a fundamental logical perspective believing joseph smith is not the prophet would also be a protected religious um, belief so the fact is we all are full of religious beliefs um because for every belief, I have a counter belief. And if you want to call believing something to be religious, then not believing it would also be religious. So I would say that all of this stuff is, is um, intellectually, politically, and I would say legally vacuous. And I would hope that future generations can see this the way we look back at slavery and the justification for slavery. The justification that religious people need a special carve out is on its face ridiculous because we are all religious. We all have religious views. It's just mine are are, are contrary to yours. It's yeah. Yeah. Religiously, there is a God. Sorry, John. Say that last part again. You muted. Oh, I'd say that that the belief the the belief of or in God is a religious belief. Yeah. Not yeah. that only having one particular highlighted special belief in God would be a religious belief. And that's 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 really the problem with the Oaks argument is it gives special privileged status to believing certain things, not actually belief or religion itself. Yeah, let's just start a religion where we believe instead of Joseph Smith is in heaven to the right hand of the Father or whatever, that he's just in hell. Let's just believe that. That's my new religion. And don't well, Ironically, the religions all got together and encoded in the tax code what a religion is. And to be a religion in the United States, you have to do things like operate a higher educational institution. Um, so 
if you were a billionaire, you could do it. If you just buy a school, call it a religious, and do a couple other things, you could have a religion. But you and I, it's impossible to found a religion in 2022. Nothing's impossible. Did you hear where I came from three years ago? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Onward, ho. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe Schools versus Morrissey Baru. Um, not 2019 case. Um. So we talked about the ministerial ex exemption. I kind of, I kind of hinted at that before in the in that in that um, court case um, with the Deseret Jim. Um, so in this case, um, there was a teacher in a school, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe Schools, and they they fired a teacher. And they didn't give cause for firing the teacher. And I can't remember um, what the details of the case were. But they claimed that they, they had ministerial exemption because since it was a religious school, the teacher was acting as a minister of the religion. Now, the teacher said, I have never been, you know, I was never, I was hired as a, as a, as a just a regular teacher. I was never given any ministerial duties. I was never identified as a minister. I never had anything that would indicate. As a matter of fact, they made it clear that I wasn't a minister, that I was just a school. And now the church is declaring that I'm a minister, and therefore they can just fire me at will anytime with no cause. Okay. Um, so the 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 which 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 side do you think the church came down on? Um, we're going to have Samantha answer this one. Well, think, I'm guessing they want to be able to call anyone, whatever they want. Indeed. The church is a uh, briefing, um, um, you know, um, sides that, that in a school, the, the church can declare everybody to be a minister. Now I, I, I really want to call out the, the Mormon hypocrisy on this front because the, the concept of minister ministerial authority is fundamental and key to Mormon theology. I've already hinted at this this evening, that the priesthood is an immutable force that has been consistent throughout all of human history, and it was lost through the great apostasy, making all churches, in the words of Joseph Smith, or in the words of God, according to Joseph Smith, an abomination. And the only way to get out of that ab state of abomination that the entire world was in in 1805, in 1810, was to restore the priesthood. And the, one of the big problems with all these false priesthoods, but only the actual priesthood. And the church is very adamant about this. They keep track of who ordained whom. They give people cards and say, I am authorized for this and I'm not authorized for this. And they talk about callings and authority. And they're adamant that prior to 1978, nobody with brown blood could um, have this ministerial priesthood. They're still adamant that no... Um, no woman can possess this um, this priesthood. The church is very rigid in its definition of priesthood to you and me, but not to the lawyers. To their lawyers, a ch the ministers of the Mormon church are whomever the Mormon church says they are. Okay. I think it's an important point. Yeah. All right, let's, let's keep moving forward. Me yeah. too. <laughs> All right, Roman Catholic Diocese of, of Albany versus Lacewell, 2020 case. Um, uh, New York regulation mandates that employer health insurance plans cover abortion, including religious entities. So, so there was a New York state law that said if you're going to give health insurance um, to, to um, if you're going to give a health insurance policy, by law, you have to allow women the, the, the right for um, that sort of care. And and the, the churches argued, the, 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 the church in, in Albany argued that they don't have to, um, that they they are exempt from that because of their deeply held religious beliefs or whatever. Um, OK, so here's what the church said. Um, the Mormon church, the question of religious autonomy presented here holds exceptional importance from the amnesty faith communities rely on the doctrine of religious autonomy to carry out their vital work. Without this court intervention, religious institutions in New York will blah, 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 problems, da, da, da. So the, the key part there is it is key for them to carry out their vital work that the church 
exercise the power of health care over women. And let's be honest, it's about women. These issues never come up with health care directed at men. You never see the church intervening in the distribution of Viagra pills to men. You never see, you've not seen the church have one word against men getting penis extensions. As a matter of fact, you never see the church have any problem with people getting boob implants. But they do have problems with women, especially young women, especially young trans men getting mastectomies. Very curious. I can put a bag of slop in my tits and the church is perfectly fine with that. But if I remove them, then the church has religious problems. Sorry for the divergency. But that's key to this case that the church signs on it. The church insists that it has the power to take employees who are sec doing secular jobs because the church owns businesses. Um, and um, this this jumps on the Hobby Lobby case, which, as best I could tell, the church did not um, um, file an amicus briefing in from 2018. Of course, the Hobby Lobby case um, does the same sort of thing. 2018, under the Trump administration, they say, we have the right to choose what health care um, women who work for us can receive and what they can't receive. So Hobby Lobby um, won't buy, won't do any any um, contraceptive care, won't pay for IUDs, won't pay for anything. But again, they're only laws that affect women. So according to the church, to carry out their vital work, they have to have the ability to decide what health care women can and can't receive. And and specifically, isn't it about whether women can use contraception, whether women can use birth control, whether women have elective abortions? What what am I missing, Samantha? I don't know, but I'm guessing they don't have a thing about men getting vasectomies. Yeah, interesting. No. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, the church insurance used to pay for vasectomies, but not for like tubal. Ligation. Even though that fully stops new spirit babies from being able to come down versus an abortion just ends one potential pregnancy, but you can still get pregnant a bunch of other times. There's another important issue here that sometimes gets glossed over. The church isn't just insisting that it has the right to decide what health care can be distributed. But, and, and mind you, we're talking about health care decisions between a physician and a, and a woman who happens to work for the church, potentially in a secular, non-religious role. The church says it gets to decide that. But the church also operates in, in where they um, will review um, with the employer what health care is being distributed. So the church not only is saying, I can decide what health care decisions you and your physician make, the church is also insisting on the right to inspect and monitor, control, and decide on and fund what healthcare decisions women make. Because let's be honest, it's women. Okay. Do you do you mean like in in real time? As in, could they theoretically come in and ins and inspect that, or do you just mean when they're deciding what plans to give to what people? Like, how does that play out? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm suggesting that health insurance is is in a, in a you know the American system is key to healthcare because otherwise the cost is so astronomically it's it's um mm -hmm. it's conceptually the same as not having healthcare. Um um so by um allowing the church to decide which procedures its um, insurance provider will and will not fund. You're de facto deciding which procedures people can and can't do. And you're exercising an ongoing power to remain in control that they that the physicians have to report to them. And, you know, and so they can disallow these things. Interesting, because I, I just got a comment on TikTok today where somebody said, no, this girl has it all wrong. The church is all about agency. People can sin and then they will have consequences, but the church always wants to give people free agency. Never do they not do that. John Larson, your reaction. Free agency? What's that, first of all? Secondly, no, the church doesn't believe in any such thing. I mean, it, I, what, what are the, no, yeah. But Cara, that fully formed four-week-old baby in the womb, where's, where's their agency? Well, Jimmy and Emily already decided which family to come down on uh, Saturday's Warrior. And that was already decided. Do you guys know I've only been triggered once or twice and like where I needed to cry and leave the room watching something in my post-Mormon life? And one of them was Saturday's Warrior. 
And I realized that indoctrinated me and I don't like it. Who are these children? So that's down, an absolutely just sing the song for sure, John. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> like gentle rain, in dark in sky. <laughs> okay. We we've got it. We got a couple more cases that I think I think we got two two more um, that I think are important. We can get through them pretty quick. Um, Grimm versus Gloucester, 2020 case. Um, 15 year old transgender boy um, addressed the Gloucester County School Board November 11, 2014, um, to explain why he was in no danger to the student body to use the male bathroom. Um, 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 Grimm presented as a, a male and, um, wanted to use the, the bathroom. And part of the case was because he presented as a male, his argument was in part that he would cause more problem by having, um, uh, somebody who looks like a man walking into the ladies restroom. Um, and he explained that he's a person of, of worth and dignity and that he matters and that he deserves the right to go pee. Um, strangely enough, the church weighed in on this case. Um, Latter-day Saints believe that birth as a male or female carries spiritual meaning. Gender identity in large measure define who we are, why we are here upon the earth, and what we are to do and become. From an LDS perspective, the unique combination of spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional capacities of both men, males and females were needed to implement God's plan of happiness. Men and women are not interchangeable. A person's gender is to be embraced along with the complementary but distinct path that God ordains for men and women. And I would say implied in all that is the case I keep making, that the church does not believe that women can or should be equal to men. So if you take this, that gender is eternal and necessary, it's necessary because women are banned from acting in the priesthood. And when you start playing around the margins of gender, you start playing with the church's fundamental power that ensures that men rule over women um, constantly, irrevocably, and undeniably. And and it's it's their, their cases are completely predictable. If there is any case that is going to give women any sense of autonomy away from men deciding what they can do, the church is right there with an amicus briefing explaining to you how society will completely fall apart if you give marginalized people rights. I like the mental capacity bit. That's my favorite. What about you guys? Of that rant? Mm -hmm. No, of the, of, of the statement, of the church statement. Yeah. I'm just, I'm troubled. Emotional capacity. It's, yeah. it's, it's you're, 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 you, you, you ladies, <laughs> you guys are too emotional to lead. I'm just deeply troubled that a, a, a corporate religious institution is filing strong legal opinions based on its theology that like less than one half of 1% of the of the national populace even believes like j just say like, Hey, we support this law or that law, or we, we stand on this side of state's rights or that side of state's rights. But, but like to be inserting theology into the judicial system just feels tone deaf and cringy and almost like anachronistic. It's like, are we in the, middle ages like what are we doing and given how much they try to avoid sounding tone deaf you could imagine how hard <laughs> that would be for them and you can imagine how much they just love following the best standards and practices of like the psychological such like in what's best for trans people in the united states and all of the uh, psychological institutes and doctors who actually have studied these things and have uh, scientific information and informed, informing their opinions as opposed to theology. What a thing it is um, to be actually informed by science. But that Church really is, the devil. it's really just following along a, a real strong path that uh, whatever the church does is right. We're going to keep doing the things that we've previously said and not let new information and new data ever kind of like come and play in the sphere because prophets, they are supposed to know everything, They're not supposed to be informed by new data, by, you know, new best practices. We'll get as much blood on our hands as we have to, just as long as you guys still uphold us as prophets. Cara, the church accepts all truth, whether it comes through science or revelation. We just learned that at recent hashtag LDS. <laughs>
We're, we're getting a little we're getting a little salty and sarcastic here on Mormon stories this evening. <laughs> it's all oh my now. god, Jen's picking up on sarcasm today. <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's when you're faced with such blatant, um just like dirty legal maneuvering. I mean I I I, I don't blame anybody for feeling a little bit punchy um or salty when and it's just this stuff is gross. It's just, um, and this is where the church spend its money. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's let's quickly get through the last case. Really quickly, I'm just going to say, if any of you were able to see uh, the the Daily Show guy, John I Stewart. I was just thinking of how yeah. to reference that, yeah, and I when, can't put it into words. John Stewart does a great job. Yeah, uh, yeah. he interviews, I think, the governor of, of Arkansas. Yeah. And she's basically talking about why she just passed. The Some attorney general. Of, he he uh, was interviewing the attorney general of Arkansas and want to know what justification she had legally for right. overriding the consensus of the medical community. Why Why would she do that? What was her justification? Yeah. yeah I, I, hope Maven, I hope Maven can include that in the show notes because it's so brilliant because he's just saying, oh, you know better than the American Psychological Association and the American Medical Association. She's like, and we the, have our own sources. And he's like, can I see those? And she's like, yeah. we've had people testify. He's like, can we see those? Because they need to be pretty substantial to override the American Medical Association. Like, yeah. I mean, I think that's my point is like, what what does religious theology, kind of Bronze Age or 19th century religious theology, what place <clears throat> does that have in the judicial system Especially when it's trying to trump the cons the overwhelming consensus yeah. of the scientific and legal communities, it's kind of weird in 2022 that that's even tolerated. It just betrays their insecurity. They need their thing to be true. They need it to be, you know, appeased to in all imaginable channels because they're so terrified. Yeah, uh, it just feels weird. It feels anachronistic. Okay, John Larson, take all it right. back. Excellent. Let's get the the last. By the way, um, Grimm versus Gloucester. Good news. The um, Court of Appeals vacated the decision, and the Supreme Court refused to take it up. So it was um, cited for um, Grimm. Okay. Um, for at least for a while. Uh, oh. uh, okay. The last case: Bostock versus Clayton County, twenty twenty. Um, um, in the in the case, case, the court ruled that the Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act prohibits employers from discriminating on the base of sexual orientation and gender identity. So this was a a a gender identities um, um, case, and in this one, um, here's the the church's um, statement. So I want to really get to these amicabi hold differing religious beliefs. This is sometimes these amicus beliefs have like. 10 churches or 20 churches and they'll do one all together which the, the the mormon church participates that's this case and amica have nuanced views on the proper policy mix for ensuring freedom and equality for all americans they're acknowledging that they don't even all believe the same thing on on rights some of these amica um, have called for federal fairness for all legislation balancing lgbt equality and religious freedom while others have cautioned that such legislation will unavoidably pose risk to the First Amendment rights. But Amakai are united in their support for the religious liberty of faith-based organizations. Their religious liberty will be profoundly threatened if the court const um, com um, construes sex in Title VII to encompass sexual orientation and gender identity. Um. Then later on, five states, California, Colorado, New Hampshire, Utah, and Washington exempt all or most religious organizations from their employment discrimination laws entirely. This is typically done by excluding religious organizations from the definition of employer. In several cases, these broad exemptions were expressly motivated by concerns about bans on SOGI discrimination. In Utah, for example, the legislature in 2015 adopted new prohibitions on this discrimination. At the same time, it also broadened its religious exemption to protect additional religious organization, individual religious leaders. First of all, I want to make the case of saying that, that they've already done an end run in their home state around this by saying, if you're a religious institution, we exempt you from all employment laws. In Utah, the LDS Church, as one of the biggest employers, including BYU and all that stuff, is exempt from any employment law. They can do whatever they want. Let that sink in for a minute. Wow. Yeah. Um, and and then they're arguing that 
if they go on and define sexual orient sex as sexual orientation and gender identity, then it it's a threat to 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 religions. Hmm. All right, so let's drive to the conclusion. The the if if you take what is being done, what the church is arguing for. Remember, I, I argued at the beginning that if you really want to know what the church wants, what it really believes, look and see what it does with the courts, because that's the one place it has to be honest. Um, and and there, because there's no motivation whatsoever for them to um, to not give their actual position to the courts, because they want what they want, and they're looking to get um, law changed in every one of these cases. What you have is the church interpreting um, law as their freedom to do whatever they want to whomever they want with absolute impunity. It doesn't matter if if the victim was raped. It doesn't matter if the victim was taken from. It doesn't matter if the if the victim was denied va basic rights. And also implied in what I'm saying is in every one of these cases, it is marginalized, powerless people who the church goes after. And, and that speaks volumes for the church to maintain its status and its position. It has to constantly threaten um, psychological violence um, against those people who have the least amount of power. And the church is built on denying power to um, women again, and also continuing the white Protestant privileged legal status that has been the de facto status of the United States for 200 years. This definitely tells a story. And the church um, the church is supreme in the church's mind, and they have no moral obligation to anybody or anything. This sort of legal work costs a lot of money. And those of you who are still in the church, this is what you're doing. This is what you're funding. This is what you're part of. And if you didn't know before, you know now. So if you want to keep going to church, this is your organization. This is who you are. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. As a, you know, as an organization files amicus briefs, so is he, right? I mean, yeah. and you, you did, you did begin John Larson by asking the question, what does any of this have to do with Jesus? My my answer to that question is my reading of Jesus is that Jesus stood up for the, the poor and the disenfranchised and the marginalized uh, against the power structures, against the corporate interests, against the the rigid religious hypocrites. And it just it does not seem like the church's ambicus briefs speak well for where the church's heart and priorities are. Yeah. Jesus hung out with sex workers. He was telling us something. They, they are always in every society, the most marginalized people, sex workers always are. And they're always present in every society, in every age, in every time. And if you want to talk about the most daring, bold, revolutionary thing Jesus did, it was that. He took the people who had the least amount of power. Um, you, you know, he hung out with with uh, Mary and Martha. He hung out with women, and he and and that you know the people who had the least power, and that was his focus. I'm saying there's nothing you can't connect any dots between Jesus in the Gospels and the way that the church operates, and we've 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 hit on these hypocrisies you know like again i want to emphasize what i was saying 20 minutes ago the church is all about ministerial authority but they will declare women to be ministers so that they can fire them um but not give them the decency of having anything they do in the church not be an auxiliary look up the definition of auxiliary everything that women do in the church is defined to the church as an auxiliary Women are important to the church for only one thing, and that is their reproductive ability. And that is not something I want to subject anybody to. This is a corrupt, dangerous, um, backwards cancer of an idea that needs to go the same route as slavery and, you know, um, 
I don't know, invasion of other people's countries. Sammy's nodding her head, so I'm going to give Sammy the the mic for some closing thoughts from Samantha. And by the way, Samantha, we just got a comment that said, I, I like the new girl, something like that. I like the Excellent. new girl. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You got a fan, at least one fan out there. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Sam. It's been a rough night. Um, well, I mean, I don't have much to say. Obviously, all the stuff we've been talking about today is bullshit. The RDS church sucks. But you know what? <laughs> they say in all of these cases that they're, you know, it's going to infringe on their religion. And on some abstract level, they're kind of right. Because if we you know, nationally expand our ideas about who we should be empathetic towards and who deserves what rights. Like it, it does, it doesn't, it does threaten them because like their, their whole ideology is so rigid and encountering more and more people who don't subscribe to those rigid ideologies. It will bring people away from those ideas. It will loosen their grip and so you know in a way it, it is gonna impact the lds church even when it won't at all you know that feels kind of like the underlying truth here of you know just yeah that's it i'm done i'm done talking <laughs> it's bedtime <laughs> samantha goes to bed she pumpkins <laughs> she pumpkins at 10. Sam kara you're next um love you so much sam um i love all of your thoughts and you added so much to this and i'm grateful that How you're dare here you say that to me <laughs> Sam is one of the main reasons that I even left the church and I was able to think in nuanced ways. And yes, it is a threat to, yeah, that kind of like brainwashing uh, ideas about like institution above all. And then you start to realize that the way that the institution wants you to love Jesus Christ is not actually loving the people that Jesus Christ loved. And it begs the question, yeah, why does the church need lawyers as much? Why do they need apologists as much? Why can't the church just stand on its own two feet? Um, but it 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 absolutely can't. And it is unfortunate with the way that the church, I mean, they hire lobbyists. How many, when was Christ hiring lobbyists to uh, push their, you know, amicus briefs and try to get the laws passed that they wanted to do? Um, and my, my final thoughts and my wrap up is that um, just basically that the church just wants to push this this political, this mental dynamite, this anti-gay rhetoric onto the minds of its membership and think that it is beamed down from the one true beautiful creator of mankind, that this is the type of rhetoric that they want them to have. Just like John Larson said, if you want to know what the church is up to, look at what the lawyers say. And if the lawyers are directed and they're approved of by, you know, the first presidency and the people that you call a prophet and the people that you think are the mouthpiece of God, and that person right now is next in line is Elder Oaks, Elder Oaks, electric shock guy, Elder Oaks went from being you know, Utah Supreme Court justice straight into the apostleship to write all of this anti-gay rhetoric on how do we demonize gay people. That is your best that you've got. Just to echo what Sam says, church, you guys suck. You are absolutely going to be a laughing stock and a joke the second that Elder Oaks you're is put and into annoying. the second that you're put in that Oaks is put into uh to be the president and the prophet of this corporation, you're going to look like nothing more than a sheep because you have a lawyer uh, parading as a prophet seer and mouthpiece, mouthpiece for your Lord. And we know that there are way more beautiful, more expansive versions of spirituality and Elder Oaks is not going to be the arbiter of that. Excellent. Hey, can we take a Marzipan's comment? It's about 15 up at 838 and show that on screen. Yeah. It's it about, with how can anything? Well, of there it is right there how can anything infringe on the rights of a church rights are for humans not corporations thank you thank you for making that point i'm i'm actually i'm, I'm impressed that you came up with it and i'm embarrassed that i didn't the idea that the church is walking around asserting that it has the rights of humans by the church's teachings we are special all of us because we are god's children and we have rights because we're human beings the fact that this institution, which we've already established tonight, is not its its clergy. <laughs> that that one still floors me. That the church believes that you know that, that that it's not its clergy, it's not its teachings, it's not its people, and it somehow has rights that are getting hurt by other people believing or doing other things. It's a ridiculous notion, and thank you for pointing it out. Churches shouldn't have rights; they're not people. <coughs> My my hot take is that uh, it's one of the only times in my life I'll say that Boyd K. Packer was right. Uh, I think 
that gays, feminists, intellectuals, and all that people of color are the great threats to Mormonism. And in 2022, they're winning. And, uh, and it's, it's just weird that, that where your lawyers are there, will your heart be also. And it's weird that the church's sanctioned law firm, it continues to uphold racism, sexism, homophobia, misogyny. Um, and, uh, it's, and the church is imploding as a result. And, and we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg, right? Only when the church gets caught like in the Arizona case or like the amicus briefings, that's a big building full of lots of dirt of uh, lots of attorneys doing God knows what, um, you, you know, like most of the time we, we know one of the church's biggest things are NDAs um, that it, it has people sign those things over and over again. We know they operate in the darkness, in the shadows. Um, if, if you really want to be the, the organization that's bringing light and truth to the world, be light and truth. Quit lying. We I, we 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 pointed out actual lies that 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 you put in your articles in Meridian Magazine or the LDS um, um store uh, uh, whatever room. Um, we've caught you lying on the Arizona thing. We've caught you lying about this and that and the other. We've caught you plagiarizing. Just fe fess up. Like, be what you say you want us to be. Be honest. Be contrite. Be forgiving. Be repentant. Because if you want to know any reason to know the church is not true, it's that the church does not believe anything it actually says to, to people. It doesn't follow the gospel. If the church were part of God's plan, it would first and foremost want to follow the gospel as they teach it. And they refuse to at every turn. All right. Thanks, John. I, mean, I, have, yeah. to give a, I have to give a shout out uh, to Mark Elwood. Uh, we love Mark. He, he does amazing Joseph Smith history graphic novels. I think he has his volume two coming out soon. Mark, we got to have you back on Mormon stories, but Mark writes, thanks everyone. This is a great conversation. Um, yeah. And I want to thank you, John Larson for always preparing such intellectual, thoughtful and engaging content. Thank you, John. Thanks. And I think somebody uh, honestly needs to write a book that, um, about the church's legal wranglings. There's a, there's a lot. It, I, it was one of those things that doing preparation for this left so much on the cutting room floor. Sure. And yeah. I, I do have to say, Hey, I'm going to be in town <gasps> on, um, on, and we're going to record live in studio on December 1st and December 2nd, uh, which is a Friday. There will be a meet and greet with me somewhere in Salt Lake city. I'm trying to finalize the location. If you'd like to meet me in person and, um, and and say hi. I'd I'd love to I'd love to talk to folks. So um, if you if you want to see um, if you want to be uh, you know what's what's the what's the scripture? Is this the man who you know you want to be disappointed in 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 what a real person looks like? You can come meet me on uh, on December second. John, you're not you're not a disappointment uh, to meet in person at all. Uh, so I'm excited to have you in studio. And uh, I'm excited to record an episode and I want to do everything I can to support a meet and greet with John Larson. We've done that once or twice and it, it was always a fun time. Yeah, we're trying to narrow down to either like a coffee shop or a tea shop or a restaurant or a bar that we can have a, 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 a you know, a room that people can come in. The problem with bars is they're oftentimes really loud and it's really hard to have a conversation. So if anybody knows of a place of a, of a, of a, of a room we can, uh, we can get, um, and it's a good chance. I know oftentimes after the years and years, stepping out and meeting other ex-Mormons is really scary and really hard. Um, but it, to a person, it's always worth it because you get to see the humanity of, of people who came before you. So, mm -hmm. so if this is the one for you, then, um, then by God, I'd like to help facilitate it. All I right. promise I'd buy you a drink, but then too many people will want a drink. I might buy you a drink. <laughs> Do something impressive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, you're you're a firebrand and a teddy bear. Can you be both at the same time? Mm. I try. <laughs> I'm not as mean as I sound. I promise. He's uh, a good human. You're a teddy bear. We know it. We love you, John. You can't fool us. All right, John. Thanks, we love guys. you. Thank you so much for tonight. Hey, Thanks. and and, and oh, I want to thank Sam again. Um, Kara always brings it, and Sam, you were great. Um, I think you really added to the conversation. Please feel free to come on any of these in the future. 
that is very nice of you to say. <laughs> yeah, Sam, thanks for, for joining us last minute. It's always great to have you, even when it's past your bedtime. Yeah, this is a treat. I have had limited exposure to John Larson, and I was very, very, very impressed. You say nothing superfluous, which you don't find in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you hang around, ask my wife. I say lots of <laughs> sure. superfluous stuff. She, she's earned her place in heaven just listening to me ramble on all the time. Beautiful. Well, I feel the same way about you, Samantha. You say nothing superfluous. Well, that's ridiculous. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. And check out, tell us your coaching website. <clears throat> SamanthaShellyCoaching.com. That's Shelly with an EY, right? Yeah. Shelly with an EY. Thanks, John. Yeah, and check out Zelf on the Shelf and donate to their Patreon and oh, support yes, their please. work. please. Yeah. We've done some fun stuff on our Patreon. It is worth your time. Now, did you say that you that people are saying something you released recently about the faith crisis is one of the best ever. John, that was a personal comment I made to you. <laughs> <laughs> I did just recently do a video on how to navigate a Mormon faith crisis, how to alchemize it into gold. Yeah, that's worth a watch if you're going through a Mormon faith crisis. So we'll have Maven include that in the show notes. <clears throat> and come back, come back, Sammy. I will be back. And Kara? Who says plenty of superfluous things and including <laughs> all of the pronunciations of amicus briefs. I did hold my tongue on alfalfa and little rascals ideas when we were talking about uh, growing that for the land in Utah. I That's made sure good. not to call the Utah legislators little rascals. I saved that for right now. So subversuicity is all I know. <laughs> and, lots of hand, and lots of hand waving. <laughs> no, you're you're brilliant and insightful and always fun and enjoyable. Kara, thanks for gracing our studio twice is this twice in one week yeah i came back on friday when we filmed that thing with eve so i would make sure to check that out yeah. um it's doing really well it just was uploaded this morning and already has ten thousand views whoa is that like a land speed record for nuance <laughs> it is yeah, it, it is. is good that's like tiktok numbers on youtube all right anyway thanks for helping me out john i just i love you as like a mentor and just another person in this space john delin's a good guy and i'm just grateful that he came on my channel this last week and helped boost my views and help make good content for my nuance channel so thanks john well it's a great channel so check out nuance so why doesn't zelf ever I, know, have I was me just on? gonna say you're coming on zelf next week let's go we should, yeah let's yeah. do it let's do it all right all right well thanks sam thanks kara thanks john larson thanks john and thanks to maven for moderating the chats and helping out with, Yay, with the maven. time codes and the show notes also thanks to all our live stream uh commenters we love the chats that happen in the live streams we love our supporters we send them our, our gratitude we wish we could share more of your thoughts and comments but we just really love this community so shout out to you guys and gals and everyone else non-binaries Thanks so much uh, for your support. And just most importantly, thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. We couldn't do this without uh, all your support. So please support us if you can. Go to the donate button at the top of mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button. Become a monthly donor. Super chats are great. For everyone who, who donates through the super chat feature in YouTube, that's also super uh, useful. And please subscribe to us. We, we, uh, we need our YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and Instagram subscribers to click the subscribe button. We want to hit 100,000. We think we can do it in a year. We think we can hit 100,000 subs, maybe maybe a year and a half. If you're but, on a sub train, just go with Zelf, Nuanto, Mormon Stories. Make sure you sub all of them. Yep. And John Larson's got a channel too, right, yeah. John? Yeah. Yeah. If you want to hear me rant about things that are uh, not Mormon related, you can. Um, What's your channel? Homesteading stuff. Um, uh, last time we were talking about guns, uh, next, the next one that we're going to talk about why, um, you shouldn't fear, um, uh, civil war. Okay. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> that is a fear of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one that's like, should you have children? Hint, the answer is yes. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 So if, if you enjoy, uh, my random thoughts, Very then listen to that. If not, Hey, we're cool. All right. All right. All right, everyone, be good to each other, be kind to each other, uh, stick up for the marginalized and the disenfranchised, um, and uh, just peace. We'll see you all again peace. soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody. See you soon.